So Piyush is basically associate professor at a, a Department of Applied Mechanics at the India Institute of Technology, IIT Madras. So his group is, uh, he, he did a BE in a BE college, uh, which is a very well-known college and a famous college for engineering in Kolkata here, Aura. And then he did uh, MTech in uh, IIT Kanpur. Then he did a PhD at uh, North Dakota State University. So he's a mechanics uh, person. So he works on uh, smart uh, biopolymers and mechanics of polymers, uh, thin films. And then he works on uh, mechanical actuation and things like that and uh, soft materials like polymers. And uh, so his background is from the engineering. He has engineering background. He also works on cement polymer composites and their mechanics uh, to understand the uh, applications and things like that. So you can look at uh, his uh, profile here. So you can also contact him uh, by email after these, uh, you know, this lecture. So Piyush is basically an expert on the technique and then uh, mostly he, he uh, studies the mechanics of various materials. So he's a very uh, resourceful person. He also works on the uh, micro crystals of, uh, uh, you know, metal organic uh, complexes in collaboration uh, with, you know, his colleagues at uh, IIT Madras, uh, T. Pradeep, who is very well known. So he also has interest to uh, work on mechanical properties of uh, molecular material. So this is a very good connecting point. So he understands both the, you know, requirements from both the sides, from the technique point of view and also materials point of view. And uh, so we are going, he's going to give us uh, basics about the nanomedication. And then Calvin Sun also extensively uses this technique and uh, he's, uh, uh, at the uh, Department of Pharmaceutics and uh, University of Minnesota. And uh, so uh, he, uh, his background is in the uh, pharmacy, solid state uh, pharmaceutical materials. And uh, he did BSc uh, in pharmacy at uh, Shanghai Medical University. And then uh, he did PhD in uh, University of Minnesota where he is a uh, professor right now, in the same place. And so uh, Calvin works on pharmaceutical materials formulation and powder compaction, tabletability, and structural mechanical property relationship. So Calvin kind of, uh, you know, pioneered uh, uh, this area at the interface of uh, pharmaceutical solids and then, uh, you know, uh, structural mechanical property correlationship. And then, then he bridges this knowledge to the development of the, uh, you know, processes, uh, mechanical processes for the uh, powder related uh, problems in the pharmaceutical industry. So he extensively collaborates uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical companies. So he's uh, very popular in that area. So he's a very good, uh, you know, uh, very well known name. You know, if somebody needs to understand the mechanical properties of pharmaceutical solids, and so he's one of the best people uh, who could be approached. And uh, we have also collaborations with him, and uh, we have been working from the beginning uh, on these problems. So he goes more extensively into the pharmaceutical processing while our expertise is mainly on the crystal engineering from structure mechanical property point of view. So he's a nice compliment to say he's a good friend of me. And thank you, Calvin, uh, Calvin for accepting uh, to deliver this. And so Calvin is basically going to give us more applied uh, kind of uh, information in his talk. So he's going to talk about the uh, structure mechanical property relationship and then use of nano indentation for understanding the mechanical properties, like you know, single particle uh, mechanical properties. For example, if you take a piece of crystal, then you characterize the mechanical properties using the nano indentation, and then you basically take that knowledge to the bulk properties. Like, you know, so it is bridging the molecular level to structure to the crystal, single particle crystals to then powder to then the full process. So it is like multi-scale approach. So he has a, a good up, uh, basically understanding of several steps in this process. So he also collaborates with other people working on different scales. So it's a very good uh, uh, you know, opportunity for us to listen to him today. And uh, then we have uh, Said Asif. Uh, so Asif is uh, kind of, you know, whatever we have in nano indentation. So most of the things, the development part, you know, the technique itself. So this is a, it's not a very old technique, although this technique was known for a long time. This instrumented indentation has seen a lot of uh, improvements in last uh, couple of decades, actually. You know, so ASIF was instrumental in developing this technique itself. So many components in nano indentation are uh, credited to his inventions, some of them. And he has also won several awards, for example, in US, uh, 
uh, in the global, uh, like, you know, there are 100 inventors. So if you take, then, you know, there is a, so he has won the prize within this 100 uh, four times so for uh, his inventions in the nano indentation related to the nanomechanics. So Asif uh, is a managing director of Industrial Nanotechnology Private Limited, and he's based in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, so he did a BSMS, uh, BSc and MSc from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And he did his PhD at uh, Oxford University. His main capability is in the development of nanomechanical testing and uh, instrumentation. So he's basically, you know, kind of a person who has developed most of the techniques that we, the, the parts, you know, components of the nano indentation that we use day to day. For example, DMA is a very popular and a very uh, new technique, you know, new addition. So he's one of the people uh, who is instrumental in developing that. So you can basically contact him here and uh, you can look at more information about uh, his, uh, some of his company and other details here. So with this, I think uh, we are ready to go. And uh, so I uh, stop here and uh, I uh, request uh, uh, Piyush to take over and I think we are on time. So Piyush, so uh, we have 35 minutes for your lecture and uh, once you finish, the, we, I will uh, basically ping you five minutes before, around at 30 minutes, then you finish in 35 minutes. Then we have 15 minutes for the questions. So I request all the participants to mute themselves until we have time for questions. And then uh, we have, I request everybody to basically, uh, uh, you know, be ready for the discussion. So the main idea of this conference is to have people only uh, from the expert groups and then we have a, a decent discussion at the end of the meeting, so end of the talk, so that you know we clearly understand and discuss the uh, in-depth, uh, you know, details of these uh, things. So, so please uh, uh, be ready to ask questions. So we have enough time. Fifteen minutes time is good enough time, I think, for discussion. Piyush, please. Sure. Just let me uh, share the screen. Pratyank, can you uh, let me know when it is visible? So that, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. just waiting for the slideshow. Yeah, it's it's okay now. It's fine, clear. Yep, it's good. Yep, and I'm audible as well, right? Yeah, all clear, all good. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so the, thanks, uh, Professor Malareddy, for the introduction, and thanks, Pratyank, for uh, inviting me. And a very good, as Pratyank said, very good uh, afternoon, evening, morning to all my friends, depending upon where you are. Now. Uh, uh, this is the title of my talk, as you see the basics of nano indentation. So I will uh, quickly go to the major takeaways from this slide, uh, from these presentations. And uh, actually my job is very simple. I have only two takeaways, just to talk a little bit about uh, the fundamentals of nano indentation. And I know that uh, uh, this audience is primarily from the chemistry or pharmaceutical background. So I will not go into the details of the, the mechanics aspect of that, uh, but I will still try to give you a feel about uh, the, the fundamentals of uh, this uh, nano indentation. And then some discussion on different factors contributing to the mechanical properties of the organic crystals. So that's the uh, kind of responsibility I have. Uh, as you see, it's only two points. Now my as I said, my job is simple. It is only to set the stage for uh, the Professor Kelvin, who is actually the expert in this area, uh, to, to, to actually uh, uh, talk in more in details and more specific to the organic crystals uh, and things like, and, and related things. Okay, so these are the takeaways. We will uh, talk and look at the fundamentals of nano indentation, and we will discuss on different factors contributing to the mechanical properties of the nano organic crystals. Now, uh, let's go to the, what is indentation? Forget about nano indentation. Let's go to the indentation. What is indentation and what is an indenter? I can bet you all of you have used it. All of you know what it is. All of you uh, use uh, every now and then. And it's all about buying mango from the, uh, from the market. Or if you often visit your kitchen, it's all about checking whether the, your rice is boiled or not. Right? So what essentially you do to distinguish between a ripe mango and a, 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 a green mango, all you do is go and press and see and get a feel out of it. Similarly, the rice, every five minutes, 10 minutes, if you are a cook like me, you will go and check how much it has actually boiled. Now, 
what are you doing there? You are actually applying some load, knowingly or unknowingly, and trying to get the feel whether you actually find the the in the case of a uh, uh, in case of a mango whether it is uh, soft enough or in the case of a rice whether it is boiled enough. So essentially, you are measuring unknowingly how much the displacement it is undergoing under the load you are applying. Only thing is that you are not quantifying anything; it is purely coming from your experience. And many times also we do that as I uh, I mean while while we play with our birthday balloons, like we do like these things. I will I will talk about this uh, again. But this is all. about indentation so as simple as that so now you know what indentation is right but then the question is what is that uh, what is a nano indentation about right what is nano indenter and what is a nano indentation about <clears throat> it's exactly the same thing that you are doing while you are buying uh, mango or uh, looking at the uh, boiled rice only difference here is now you are actually trying to go into a smaller length scale of say nanometer range and then trying to tease out the information from there so with there you are applying a load also very small quantity or small uh, uh, magnitude and you are also expecting the displacement to be very small that is the only difference as far as uh, your indentations and nano indentation is concerned and what is nano indenter all it does is it's an equipment which is allowing it to precisely control the load at that level or that magnitude of nano newton or something like that and also measure the displacement which is in the nanometer or close a few hundreds of nanometers so that's what a nano indentation is and that's what a nano indenter does okay now the question is the same thing they say this information how can i use in my material to uh, to get some useful information out of that that's the whole idea and particularly this application of this nano indenter or nano indentation technique is uh, uh, is i would say not very matured as far as this field of organic crystals are concerned or this pharmaceutical industry is concerned so there is a lot of uh, uh, scope lot of uh, open ground in front to actually uh, use this uh, in future okay with this brief introduction let me uh, uh go to a very basics of nano indentation and particularly keeping in mind that the students are uh, from uh you know uh, background of pharmaceutical and chemistry so they may not be knowing this but if you are from a mechanics background this may not be a very useful uh, uh, for you because you already know these things but uh to give an idea about this uh, what is in nano indentation and exactly uh, uh, uh like and how it it actually works now coming back to that balloon like i said it is all about it's very similar to like you have this i'm showing in this this direction uh just to for the clarity is basically this it's basically doing this and that you are doing at uh with a very precise control of the load and measurement of the displacement you can see what is actually happening how the surface is taking the curvature that's all about this and i'm also going to show you a very similar uh, animations or schematic and from there i will take you uh, to the uh, like the, the parameters that we actually quantify from this type of uh, measurements okay all right so this is a animation or cartoon schematic uh, with this is the indenter uh, and this is the uh, sub sample this is a substrate well the sub sample to substrate ratio is not really to the scale just to give an idea and here on the right hand side what i will show is just keep a watch what i will show is that when you are applying the load this is undergoing uh, uh, it is going into the substrate like we have seen for the balloon and then if i plot the load versus the displacement that it is getting i mean it is undergoing how the plot would look now this circle here where you see it is load versus time tells that how you are loading you can load it like you can load keep on loading loading stop there which is Uh, like a flat uh, uh, time uh, uh, flat uh, line that you see and then again you can unload there are different ways you can do the loading and unloading i've shown only one for your convenience to understand so this is the time axis this is a load axis you can also vary this in a way you want but this is an example so we will see what happens actually when you are actually applying the load now remember you can do it in two ways you can either apply the load and measure the displacement which is called load control or 
you can actually apply the displacement and measure the load, which is the displacement control. That's, that's a little bit of details, but the idea is let's apply a load on this sample and see what happens. And then also look at the load displacement plot on the right hand side. Okay. So it touches the surface and it goes into it and then it goes, you take it out and that's what you will see. Of course, there will be some recovery of this. Most of the materials will show some recovery, but will not get into that details. So you have seen that it has come inside, made an indent and then gone out, gone up again. And this is the corresponding load and the displacement. And I will explain this thing because this is the most fundamental aspect of nano indentation. And you need to have some idea about why this is coming like this, why this is coming like this, and how do we actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, calculate some essential information from this, uh, uh, from this uh, schematic and from this load displacement profile. Okay, that's the idea. <clears throat> so, I will come to the dimensions later. Wait, don't worry, so that you can connect it to your system. Now, now imagine, forget about this. Now, let's say the indenter was at this position where it was indented and it was as rest for some time. Okay. Now we need to just uh, have a little bit of idea about two or three, uh, what to say, dimensions of parameters when we do indentation, because those are the very essential thing which finally going to help us in getting the modulus and the hardness or say other mechanical properties. Now, when the indenter indents like this, as I was also showing with the balloon, the profile, right? You can see that it is not just going to be a point contact. It will be actually a circumferential contact. So if it's a circumferential contact, then there is a depth that uh, it, will, uh, it will actually be uh, attached to uh, the material with the indenter, right? And that one uh, is actually very important for us to know. So what I mean is where it is exactly the surface is leaving the indenter, that depth is called the contact depth. <coughs> so, so this one is the uh, contact, uh, contact depth, how much of the material is in contact when it has gone inside. And then, of course, this one is the total displacement or maximum displacement, which corresponds to this one. Correct. So that is what it is. And let me put the, bring this up. So this is called HC. Typically, it can be called by other uh, uh, way also. It is HC, the contact depth. And now the area the corresponding to this uh, to this contact is actually called the contact area. And if you project this, this is the actually the contact area corresponding to this particular state of indentation. Now this contact area and this contact depth is or are actually very useful two uh, factors for us in moving forward and calculating the modulus and hardness. Okay, but I hope this is clear when I say contact uh, depth and I say contact area, it is clear from the schematic what they are. Of course, it has a lot of details, but we'll not go to that because keep, keep in mind that this AC and this HC, uh, they are going to actually uh, uh, depend on your material system significantly. So it's better that we have it in our mind, what we mean by this contact area, which is a projected area, and this contact depth, which is that, uh, is that the depth that uh, at least the material is just uh, leaving the, uh, the, uh, the indenter surface. Okay, good. Now let me give you a little bit of an idea about the dimensions, because from this is from where you will start connecting to your materials, to your uh, to the crystals that you are actually working with. For example, the, this L, L is the sample length, doesn't matter. L is a sample length. It doesn't matter. It can, we have worked with as small as micron to centimeter because it is all, it is all doing, it is sitting on the substrate and your indenter is actually uh, just uh, taking a very small uh, region to indent. There are slight, slight more details attached to it, but let's not worry about that. Uh, the L is, the, it can go from micron to centimeter. Now, thickness of the, uh, the T, the thickness of the sample. But this is little tricky because again, I would say it can go from a uh, uh, huge range uh, because beyond a certain range, it doesn't matter whether it is a millimeter or a centimeter, it's say it is a bulk. But beyond, below certain value, you have to be careful that to make sure that when it is too less, then what will happen is that substrate will start actually interfering in the behavior that you, in the behavior of the sample which we call a substrate effect, will not get into details. So there is some uh, restriction as far as uh, the lower bound is concerned because the substrate will start interfering. Otherwise, it, it's okay. I mean, as far as the, uh, uh, 
the, uh, the height of the sample is concerned, so long it is not touching the machine head, it is okay, that doesn't matter. But there are also ways how you, even if you, uh, for the thin films or for materials, which is very thin, you can actually, uh, uh, you, uh, even if the substrate effect is there, you can, there are ways how you can get rid of the substrate effect. So this is, and then B, the B is uh, this, this width, like uh, the, uh, as you see here. So uh, let, let's say the indenter diameter is about 50 to, uh, uh, let's say 50 to 500 nanometer, it can go even slightly higher. Now then when you actually indent it, it will cover this area, which can go about, let's say 100 nanometer to 750 or even 1000 nanometer, depending on the type of materials, which you can visualize. Uh, if you have a dough, if you press it, and then uh, the same dough after five hours, if you come and press it, you will see the area that is caving in is actually is, uh, is, 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 uh, is different, right? So this is something, uh, the basics that you need to keep it in your mind because only then you will be able to connect with your system. So I hope this gives an idea about the, uh, uh, about the sample uh, dimensions. Okay, let me come to the, again, the very fundamentals of this indentation. So first figure shows the before indent, second one is a during indent and after indent. And all I have done is I've zoomed into some area of already we have indented in the previous slide. Now, color change, just to give your information, color change indicates the change in uh, or the motion of the particles. So it can be translation, rotation, spinning, whatever way you can imagine. So that's the color change. So before, when you are doing an indent, what you are seeing is that most of the blue has actually changed to green, right? So that means that there is some effect of the load as far as the motion of those particles are concerned. Now, what are these rectangular blocks? Don't worry about, again, at this stage, about what they are, but just imagine that something is going on inside. We are trying to actually uh, represent to a cartoon uh, that what, uh, uh, what it is going on inside. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So now when you're after indent, when you take this indent out, as you see, most of the materials which were there goes back to the blue color, which is exactly the same as this, whereas some of them actually still retain their position and remain in the green. So what does that mean is that this region that is circled and the green has undergone a plastic deformation, right? Whereas the other particles, most of the bulk around it is actually has undergone an elastic deformation. So as soon as you've taken out the load, it basically goes back to its original position. And primarily when you measure the more in the elastic behavior of the material, you are actually, or essentially you are uh, uh, finding out the, the property of this bulk rather than this local region. Although this local region is going to affect the, 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 the characteristics of this region around, but primarily you are actually interested more in this and you are determining the property of that as well. Although you can shed some light about this plastic region. So locally around the indenter, there will be a plastic region where there's a dissipation of some energy that is coming from the indenter is dissipated through the, from the, some plastic motion, but otherwise rest of the things are mainly elastic, which goes back to its original position. So, uh, keep this is all keep this also in mind now let me go to the very basics i will just have one slide no equations or anything about the mechanics because uh, we, we need to have an idea where it is coming from okay before i go to the formula for the uh, elastic modulus i just want to give a brief idea that what it is and what it is uh, where it is coming from <clears throat> now when we apply a load right anything whenever whenever we apply a load what do you expect one is of course a rigid body motion that means well, you apply a load and it goes like this. That's called a rigid body motion. But when the rigid body motion doesn't happen, when there is something that is stopping it, so when you apply a load, what happens is that every point here will undergo certain deformation or displacement. Now, if we can find the dis displacement, nature of the displacement of each of these points, we can actually collect a lot of information about that material. For example, how is the stress distributed? Where is the most of the stress is concentrated? Where is the maximum stress? And all these things we can find out uh, from that, uh, if you can find out that displacement behavior of a displacement function. Okay, I will not get further into that, but this is important to visualize. Now, there are, of course, be, uh, the materials is one of the important factor which decides what is going to be the uh, displacement function. But one of the most important thing which also plays a role is the contact. Uh, I mean, how is the pressure when you are applying the load, right? When you are applying the load, let's say from here to here, how is the pressure that are, uh, is getting distributed at the contact? Because that significantly affects 
what is going to be the displacement or this or the strain or the stress at the point p1 p2 and p3 and uh, like for example these are some of the examples that i've shown here like can be the possible pressure distribution as you see this is like this this is like this and this is a more of a random type now where do originate from actually they depends on the nature of the contacts for example if you take two spear and try to uh, one second and and you try to push them with a load the nature of the, the the contact area that is actually coming there in the picture when the disc taking the load is going to be different from when you take the same uh, uh, load but then you are putting as a cylindrical surface on the uh, on the sphere so i hope you understand like what i'm trying to mean so the same magnitude of the load depends on the nature of the contact the pressure distribution is going to be different and the depending on the pressure distribution my p1 p2 p3 will experience different load and displacement okay now depend the nature of the contacts are primarily classified into two ways one is the physical and the chemical characteristics of the contact surface and the other is the shape of the contact surface by the shape i mean as i said it is a two cylinder or two sphere or one cylinder one sphere things like that and about the chemical and the physical characteristics it tells that whether it is a friction is there whether there is an adhesion between these two surface which is very very important for biological samples whether the adhesion is there if that is there then the contact is going to nature of the contact is going to be different and thus the pressure distribution is going to be different and thus the formulation that we use to find out the stress strain or all these things are going to be different now based on this nature of contact if you are in the indentation you are starting the indentation you will come across this terminology hertzian jkr dmt like this essentially they are the different types of contacts depending on the factors i mentioned and more primarily they are basically how the pressure is distributed Uh, when the load is applied on the surface by an indenter okay i will not get further into this because this itself is if we take a lot uh, quite a few classes uh during the course now i will go to the formula where it is actually material scientist or for the pharmaceutical people that is uh, of interest now fine we said okay we can do the indentation uh, we can find out how much uh, it is going in and all these things but that doesn't help so unless we actually quantify something and give it to the designer or we tell uh, the user that this is how it is and the two most fundamental thing that you can quantify or you can think about is the elastic modulus which talks about the load deformation characteristics in the linear regime and the hardness which is a measure of some measure of the the resistance or to to the plastic deformation right so they are e and h now this slide i will spend one or two minutes so that you understand uh, where it is coming from now snedden's formula actually we derived but we will not go to derive here is given the dp dh p is a load h is a displacement so you can understand the load displacement uh, slope of this load displacement particularly at the contact which is the called the stiffness because load by displacement is can be said as a stiffness so this contact stiffness is given by beta which is a constant er which is the uh, as you said the elastic modulus and most importantly the contact area right so this is what it is given by the snedden's formula and if you see here all we need to know is if we can measure this dpdh and we can measure ac then we can actually find out what is er elastic modulus okay that's the whole idea so now what you do is do you need by doing indentation let us see whether you can actually find out this ac and find the the dpdh then your job is done and you are all set to find er as well as the hardness that's it now when you do the uh, nano indentation as i have shown you you will come up with a typical load displacement plot like this now this is the maximum displacement and this is the contact okay now the dpdh is essentially the slope of this unloading curve okay unloading curve particularly the initial portion where the material the indenter is just losing the contact and going out of the uh, uh, leaving the material surface so that how do we get is hc as you can see this hc is equal to h max minus this part okay and now there are different ways you can find dpdh because that act essentially is a function and you can take the derivative of that uh, that with respect to h and then find out that value at the h max that's how you can do but the, the oliver far is one of the approximation that normally we make and work for many materials it tells that okay it is h max minus some constant times e max by this which is this region will give you the hc okay so that's hc so that means you were basically getting what is the contact depth what is the contact depth of the of the indentation now if you know the contact depth just visual try to visualize if it is a cylinder 
if you know the contact depth, you can easily find out what is the area uh, of the, uh, the projected area. Similarly, if it is a cone, cone conical indent, it's a cone, you can also find out if I give you the HC, you should be able to find out what is your projected area. Now, in this way, we actually can find out from the known geometry, the information, we can actually find out what is the contact area through this area function and which depends on the indenter that you are using. So you have this HC, you have this AC, and you are all set to plug it in here and quantify the elastic modulus and the hardness to basic parameters from this nano indentation. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, these are the uh, things which you can quantify from here, but there are a lot of information we can actually also collect from uh, the load displacement plot itself. And as a beginner, uh, well, the day first, uh, uh, the first day you go to the indentation, if you have some idea about how the load displacement plot looks, you will feel a little bit more confident to know actually what is going on inside, whether it is something wrong with some, some artifact or something like this, whether it is something that you're expecting and is not coming, things like that. So the load displacement plot is the raw data and looking at this, inspecting at this, you will get to have an idea about some of these. I will quickly take you through this, some of these uh, to give an idea uh, what each of these. For example, you see here, this one, it is going and straight away coming. So that means it is exactly following the same path between the loading and unloading, which tells that essentially there is no loss, no dissipation, nothing. And it's a purely elastic material, right? Because as yes, you can see that it is the way it is going, the way it is coming up. So it doesn't uh, really uh, have any loss. This is a very uh, generic uh, plot where you see that there is a, it will be actually in initial linear elastic, but then it goes plastic, uh, an elastoplastic, plastic, and then when you are actually taking the load off, it is coming down, down, and it is meeting there. Now here, if you look at it, if you compare this plot and this plot, number two and number three, you see that here it is having a larger plastic deformations at the beginning, and then the elastic, this part, the, the, the removing, when you are removing the load, it is not very different. So we, it tells that something is going on at the initial part, which is actually taking me deeper early during my load regime as compared to my second one. Coming to this one, this is number, I, I should have marked it, I'm sorry. Coming to this one, which is a second row, first, uh, uh, first one column, you see there is something like naking. We call it a naking. Why this naking is happening? Because the material here is, uh, I mean, basically you are holding, but then still it is undergoing like this, which means that material is actually undergoing still some, some change in inside. And that's why the displacement is not constant. Instead, it is still showing some displacement, which is telling that something, some creep type of thing is creeping is going on. So you have to definitely then give some more time for the system to get into equilibrium before you actually can unload. Otherwise, you will get wrong information. If you look at the next one, you see here, I have marked with a, with a green circles. And this is a very, very important one for the organic crystal, but uh, you are working on the organic crystal. You see some step kind of things. Sometimes it is called steps, but most of the time in the organic crystal community, and particularly if it is not a slope type, but it is a straight type, it is called poppings. So as you can see here, what is actually happening is at this point, the load is same, but there is a displacement happening, right? So that means it is something is taking you quickly inside, and then, uh, 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 and then again you are loading and then quickly inside. So these are the poppings. So you can imagine that when you are applying a load, something is going on here, which is uh, either sliding or crack or something, which is taking you, making the displacement larger compared to the load. And then again, you are uh, maintaining the load displacement plot. Now this one that on the right hand side, if you are working on the biological samples, that is something that you can come, uh, you can encounter at the beginning uh, that uh, very, or something, a very random porous structure. You will come across this type of load displacement and you can, uh, you can say that, okay, either the teeth is problem or there's a porosity or something is there, which is actually creating this type of a load indentation. So this load intent is and just try to visualize that, okay, when I apply a load, I'm expecting a displacement to, uh, to uh, happen in this way. But when it is not happening and something is different, then that means what is going on under the indenter? That is something that you have to try to visualize, okay? And then you can uh, come, I mean, you can match with the load displacement plot. Okay, so that's about the little bit about the background about uh, the indentation. I hope it gives you some idea about what it is going on, how we are doing the elastic modulus and hardness and things like that. Of course, there are more details, but let's not worry about it at this stage. 
Now, why are we interested in the mechanical properties of these organic crystals? Now, uh, again, these organic crystals or cluster uh, materials or uh, molecular materials, uh, like whatever you say, these are, depending on the applications, mechanical properties are extremely important. For example, in flexible electronics, for example, uh, bending rigidity and flexibility of the plastic crystals, which Professor Maladadi would be very interested. Uh, Kelvin would be interested in the uh, tabulating characteristics and uh, uh, some others will be interested in the stress-induced transformation. If there is some transformation happening, which uh, because of the local stress or because of the load that you are applying at a point, and somebody might be interested in the fracture toughness as well, because that's also related to uh, milling and the uh, tabulating and all these things. So there are you, you can actually understand so that there is a need to find out the mechanical properties of this of these organic crystals. But how do we find mechanical properties? Typically, you will see. That when we talk of mechanical properties and you go to the undergraduate labs or talk to your undergraduate friends, you will see that they're talking about the tensile test or bending, three point bending or torsion shear, like these type of tests, which are a big setup of equipments. So in that way, you need a really uh, big sample to actually uh, you know, <clears throat> understand uh, uh, the mechanical properties of this. However, we cannot afford to do that. As, an, as a crystal uh, 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 person, you understand that all we are your samples, you with that you, you cannot afford to go to a centimeter scale sample always. So that's where the nano indentation comes into picture, where particularly beside not only just the mechanical property, you will be also getting the local information about the crystals and understand the mechanism going on at that uh, at that lane scale, which your other the uh, continuum scale experiments will not be able to provide because they are talking about the gross property. So that is where the nano indentation becomes so useful that, okay, I want to have a very small sample. I want to, to have a precise measurement. I want to take a look at the local information and things like that. And, uh, and uh, the nano indentation comes to be a very, very useful equipment. And it is gaining a lot of popularity in these days as far as organic crystals are concerned, okay? Now, uh, just quickly, this is my observation that I want to share. And, uh, what I've noticed is that if you look at the papers that is in the early 2000 or even a little earlier, that time people are just happy with determining the mechanical properties of these organic crystals. Later, people are actually trying to use this inventor to understand the mechanism, the structure property relationship as uh, we call, and then trying to find out, okay, what is the reason? What is the mechanism behind the observations that we have made uh, during the indentation? Recently, maybe already it has started, we are looking at now, okay, how this indentation can be useful in the mechanics-based crystal engineering. So what essentially it is, okay, I develop a continuum-based model. And from that model, I will tell that, okay, if you can tune the mechanical properties, uh, I will prescribe the chemist uh, that, okay, if you can tune the mechanical properties of this component in this way, then you can reach to your end uh, pro pro property or desired property. Uh, so uh, this is where I see the now uh, the trend is going towards and many uh, actually groups that actually started working on this. And here actually indentation can come very handy in developing this, those models and, uh, and even uh, calibrating those models as well. Now, next uh, uh, four or five slides, I will be talking about fine, what are the features of organic crystals uh, affecting its mechanical properties? So I'm assuming that you are a beginner here, particularly the students who are going to uh, go to the lab and then start using the nano indenter and then uh, do the indentation. And these are some of the features that you need to be actually uh, keep, uh, keep note of and, uh, and uh, that will help you to understand the results that you are getting, okay? So I will talk quickly about these things. So just one more time, I want you to go back to the, to the, to the, to the animation, uh, the cartoon diagram that I've shown that what happens under the indenter and that plastic region, that elastic region, how they change locally around this plastic region and things like that in your mind. And then it will be easier for us to understand this. Now, this is very easy to uh, uh, visualize. Now, I'm sure you have come across or you actually synthesize crystals which are anisotropic, composition wise, uh, it can be structure wise, whatever it is, even like this, if you see the one on the left is a nice, uh, and on one on the right, I actually, for me, I have used the same uh, uh, diagram and then rotate it. But you can you can understand what I'm trying to tell. And now you can see that if you are indenting this way, and uh, as opposed to you are indenting this way, you expect that the, the behavior of this plastic region around this is going to be different, and also the elastic, the spread of those plus that plastic region is going to be different as opposed to this, right? So that tells that my contact area and my contact depth is going to be different. And as a result, my 
my modulus hardness and other things are also going to be different. So if you have an anisotropic uh, system like this, where they are really uh, anisotropic as respect to the two orthogonal axis, then it, it is very common to expect uh, that, okay, they will actually show the two different mechanical properties. Okay, so this is as far as anisotropy is concerned. Now coming to this, the sleep planes, for example, imagine, of course, these are the two extreme uh, ends, but, uh, 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 but just to give you a feel again, you are indenting here, and these are your typical sleep planes, let's say, and then you indent it here as opposed to another one where you see that your planes are here, you will definitely come across two different types of load displacement bar, right? For example, here it will see, it will undergo a very smoothly, it will go up into this because it is in the direction of this. Whereas in this case, you will come across actually some pop-ins and pop-outs when, because of the slipping of this, uh, of these uh, planes. Of course, it is not easy to understand the direction of the sleep plane, but slowly with experience, you can understand that as well. So this, the sleep plane is one of the very important thing which, which is reflected both in your load displacement plot as well as in your, uh, in, your uh, you know, uh, uh, in your values that you see. And this is something that you have to keep careful watch when you are doing indentation on this. And there can be also recently, we have seen a couple of papers where they reported a staggered kind of this. And as you can visualize that, that the stress, uh, the distribution around this is very complex. And as a result, you can also understand that uh, it is going to be a very different from uh, what you have, uh, uh, what you exp expect from other two uh, sleep plane characteristics. So this is something that you should uh, keep in mind when you are doing the, uh, and I'm sure uh, Kelvin will give more insight into this as far as what bondings is involved, because it is not just the structure, it is also depends on whether the, it's the long range interactions or the short range interaction that holds them together. Depends, depending on this, the responses will be different and your measurements will be different. Okay, so that details uh, will actually come later. And this is an example from uh, Sackering, which is I've taken from this uh, paper of 2013, where you see that, uh, as I was talking about, the blue curve is for 100, uh, I'm sorry, for 0, 1, 1 pace, and the red one is for 100, uh, one, uh, which, uh, uh, and they are different. As you see, in the one case, there are a lot of poppings, as opposed to the other one, which is smooth, which corresponds to this kind of, a, um, uh, of a, uh, 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 orientation. And saccharin is one of the examples where uh, people have observed this, uh, this type of a load displacement plot. Another one which is very important is the hydrated crystal and desolvation. Now, idea that what it is going to enter, you also, and what is the role of these sleep planes as far as load displacement plots are concerned, you can also visualize that difference that what is the going to be the difference when you have a, this type of a sleep plane as opposed to this, where you have a water molecule. That depends, and then how that uh, I mean, uh, and, and how that water layer actually pull when you are um, applying a load. So this water layer can actually uh, facilitate the slipping, and also it can give a direction to the slipping depending on the type of the uh, uh, the number of layers and other characteristics uh, that is of, of the layer. So what I'm trying to tell is that water will essentially have some role in determining the behavior of these planes or this system overall under the in, uh, indenter. And uh, as far as the dissolvation is concerned, I feel that I, I read that it is actually a very important thing because for some crystals, the water actually drains out with time. And then as the water drains out, you can now expect that the material's property to change. Now, what is this correlation between this uh, water uh, that is there and uh, this, uh, the dehydration rate? That is something where your mechanical property uh, uh, can uh, give some insight and the nano indenter becomes a very, very useful you know, uh, uh, tool to actually uh, identify or to, uh, to, uh, to evaluate that. Uh, Prasip, just two to three minutes and then we go for questions. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> two plus three, five, right? Okay. No. <laughs> two. All right. I will, I will wrap it up. Just give me a second. So that's a uh, uh, crystal dissolvation. And uh, phenobar uh, phenobarbital calcium is one such which shows up the solvation and uh, uh, dissolvation. So that means the water actually goes out and shows a difference in the mechanical property. The th another one, which is very, very important, and you know that it is important, but a lot of times you cannot pick up from doing certain XRD or certain other experiments is the polymorphs. 
and uh, a certain presence of certain polymorphs as far as i know that in uh, the pharmaceutical industry it is actually sometimes uh, very mm, difficult to get rid of these polymers. So first is identification. And then you will see that actually nano indentation is a very useful customer as far as uh, finding out the polymorphs are concerned because the polymorphs depending uh, on the crystal structure, for example, the same chemical composition, I'm just for the uh, representation purpose, one is cubic here and one is hexagonal here. They, will, they can show different mechanical properties when you do under indentation. And from there, you can say that, okay, I have uh, these poly uh, polymorphs here and I need to be careful. Okay, or why this polymorph has come, that whatever is your question of interest. So that is something which nano indenter can pick up very well. And here is one example for aspirin polymorph one and polymorph two, where one is showing a smooth curve and the other one shows again, the um, these poppins, which are primarily understood because of the certain sliding happens under the indenter. That could be the one reason, or it could be because of the micro cracks, or it could be because of the, some other things as well. But clearly there will be some, some uh, polymorphs will actually show a visible distinction between the two types. And uh, recently, I seen uh, uh, I was talking to uh, to, uh, to Professor Kiran of SRM yesterday, and he was telling that polymorphs and the domain coexistence. Like for example, you have uh, the two domains of, uh, of two polymorphs existing at the same time, and then it that is very difficult again to identify and to separate out those, and then that's that's where the indentation comes come actually very handy. And I have I have put this as a great indentation to actually uh, to also give you a feel that you can do this indentation by at a by but a but a but a the by a grid beforehand and each from each you can get up and you can find out of this region this values belong to this region these values belong to this region and thus you can get a mapping of this and then you can find out okay what is the extent way of which we up to which there's another domain is present in this uh, coexistence coexisting system okay and I will, this is another thing which you need to keep in mind, this concept of pileup. For example, you see, I was talking about that when you apply a load, this plastic region is, this is a region which undergoes a plastic deformation. Now imagine that it has gone to a larger extent. So what happens is the slips or whatever uh, other mechanisms, uh, uh, um, uh, the motion, now the materials actually start going out of the plane and comes out of the surface. And then you will see that your surface is bulging like this on the both sides of the indenter. And this is something what is called pileup. And you need to be very careful about this when you are doing this, uh, uh, this indentation. And the, uh, one of the reasons is the, is the, uh, the sliding of this, uh, these planes, but there could be certain other reasons also uh, depending on what material you are applying to. And you typically, if you do that imaging, this is how it is going to look. But where is the, but then you can say, ask the question that why do I care about this even if it happens? Well, just one, uh, uh, one line I will mention here that what happens is when you are doing the pileup, remember area of contact we talked about is this area, right? But then essentially when the plastic deformation is happening, the area is much larger. So area is actually including these pileup things. So your AC, actual AC, the corrected one is actually larger than the where you have measured from your instrument. So that means the new hardness, this being small, the denominator, this actually is, uh, this being large, the denominator being large, so your H new, the hardness new is actually small. So whatever hardness you have actually measured, if you do not do the pile of correction, essentially you are going to overestimate the value more than typically it is, right? And uh, I will not go into the details, but this is another thing which is very com used, uh, I mean, often used with the nano indentation. So in this case, it is instead of a vertical load, you are applying a horizontal load like this, which is called scratch. And this is uh, the typical scratch of imaging, the post scratch imaging, where you can see the pileup on the left and right and the rear end, depending on the material. This is from polymer. That's why you are seeing so much of uh, pileup. So I'm almost done. And, uh, uh, and this scratch is actually going to imagine now these two things that I've shown earlier, that if you are instead of uh, horizontally, uh, vertically, now you are pulling it horizontally, it can actually give and give you a lot of information about the friction, about the pattern about the periodicity and things like that. So people use both indentation as well as uh, as well as the scratch together to collect information and to understand the, uh, the, the mechanism inside this uh, inside the material. So these are two very recent works uh, from, uh, from uh, Professor uh, Pradeep's lab uh, uh, and where we did the uh, mechanical characterization. And this is the most recent the chemistry of materials and we'll not going to the details. And these are some of the things that uh, you can do with the nano indenter, basically. And uh, uh, Pratyank, I will just take uh, uh, 15 seconds to quickly go through this because this gives a feel 
what indenter is capable of doing it is actually capable of doing a lot of things than just indentation just uh, doing the uh, modulus and hardness and uh, beside modulus and hardness you can find the fracture toughness you can find the phase transformation happening uh, if at all there uh, but you are under the indenter and under the load you can do the dynamic study for example when you have a water sometimes it is not like to study, but rather you can give a do a dynamic study because uh, it it act, actually isn't uh, going to show a time dependent response so in that case you can do the nano dma to to study that behavior temperature dependent behavior is extremely important because this also gives uh, you the disintegration time and things like that and how the crystal is behaving under different temperature which you can easily do and which is a very very useful thing that we use in our lab for many different types of samples believe me and uh, stress induced conductivity is uh, is also used because some of the materials under a load actually start showing be uh, behaving as a conductive like some uh, some the behaves as a photoluminescent uh, uh, so uh, the conductivity is also something that you can measure and you can actually get an idea under what load magnitude you uh, find this acting like that uh, and then scratching the friction coefficient patterns and things like that and you can do a lot of good imaging these days with the uh, with the current uh, systems that uh pratyank and dr asif uh, offers you uh, and there are many more actually you can do i'm just i've listed few things so in a brief i would like to tell this is a very good equipment very good uh, technique uh, it is just not used to its potential it is i would say that you uh, think about it uh, more in details uh, try to uh, explore it and uh, uh, and uh, see what different ways you can uh, make the use of this uh, technique and uh, not just the modulus and the hardness so particularly this is what i would tell my uh, my uh, uh, current uh, uh, you know the the students uh, community uh, to think about this and uh, make use of that okay so i think with that i will end uh, and uh, i will take some easy questions uh, from you and as i said i have no idea about uh, much about idea about the organic crystals and uh, this but i will try to take question from the basics of uh, indentation and things like that if you have and can go into the details if necessary thank you thank you piyush thank you very much and uh, you made it very difficult to ask any easy questions you made it so easy everybody understood so you will only get difficult questions <laughs> okay, okay so uh, yeah. dr ji can you see the questions otherwise i yes i can see but i would like the people uh, to directly ask uh, maybe or so we have okay. about five Five minutes time, so. Okay. Uh, uh, taking, yeah, taking long because. Uh, Amar Prit, Amar Prit, do you want to ask or should I should I ask? Uh, hello, Prit. sir. Uh, you can yes. continue. I have uh, posted my questions in the chat. Okay, sure. So the question is, you know, Amar Prit has a, has two questions, and the, uh, how is how much it is sensitive to the surface? That is the first question. But the other thing is, if the crystal is anisotropic and if you have different phases, uh, so how do you get very reliable data? So that okay. is a, these that's are very the very good. Uh, yeah. So that's a very good question for the for when you are particularly starting uh, as a student, uh, particularly I would say. Now uh, let me come to your uh, first question, uh, where just to give you an idea what, why it is so important to have the right surface. Okay. Because if you remember, I told to this one second to this slide. If you remember, this is where I uh, uh, use this slide, and that's the reason why also indirectly I I uh, I, I explain this. So when you have a very rough surface, so what is happening is your indenter is sitting on the rough surface with the projections and things like that, and the distribution of the stress is actually going to be very different than when it is sitting on the smooth surface. and because all your analysis and all your uh, you know uh, your calculations and things like that derivations are based on the fact that it's a smooth and then yeah, the pressure distribution is such but when you are having a rough surface particular no idea about how these surface projections are you will have a difficult uh, you will have some erroneous results so okay. it is best it is good that if the surface is very uh, smooth as much as possible okay that is one and the anisotropy part i think i have already uh, talked about that uh it is important to uh, understand your structure and then you have to see which phase you are indenting because based on if you have a a nice or very obvious anisotropy like, like this and then you can understand that whether you, if you are indenting on the face on the left versus face it is likely that you expect the different response from the material and thus a different uh, mechanical properties in a brief we can talk in details later if you need but this is what i would say to uh, address a question Okay. Uh, uh, the, the other question, yeah. 
from the question is just, basically from yeah yes no, just to just to add here i got i mean similar question by Pro, uh, dr arvind bansal here just wanted to add here uh, yeah. his question sure. is mechanical behavior during nano inundation is facet dependent tableting involves compaction of large number of particles that are randomly arranged in the tablet die how can we derive meaningful information for tableting from single crystal based on nano inundation since crystal anisotropy is common in organic crystal correlation ship between nano indentation data and bulk ta tableting data remains an important challenge this is posted by mr arvind bansal from naipur mohali okay i will i will very briefly address this because this is a very generic question and also i think kelvin from his experience can address this better but what i would like to tell is this is a challenge in every field you are you are basically looking at the information uh, two different lane scale and so uh, i do not agree or i do not claim that just by finding the local information at the small scale you can actually extrapolate that and talk about the macro scale property it you cannot do that because there are several other things that comes into picture uh, as you rightly mentioned the uh, when you are actually talking about the mechanical properties at the continuum scale but here we are talking essentially about the local information which help us to understand what is going on un, i mean inside and accordingly you can go and uh, fine tune or do the go and do the manipulation which will have an effect on the macro scale property but not necessarily the effect is very linear uh, function and not necessarily what is i mean you will get exactly uh, the same the uh, uh, function that uh, same uh, behavior that you are getting at the nano scale so i will not uh, 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 say that you will can actually get a direct correlation but definitely your it is important to understand the property at the small scale which help you to tune the property at the macro scale okay uh, other question is uh, from venkatesh actually how do you know plastic and elastic regions during loading so that's what uh, so uh, so uh, that's a good question so Uh, you do not. Uh, I mean, if you have a very nice something, and you see that actually materials are undergoing a plastic and all those things, that's a different story. But if you look at the load displacement plot, okay, uh, I think I'm going other way. Yeah, if you look at the load displacement plot, see if you look at the load displacement plot, this is an indication about that how uh, that what is happening as you started applying the load. Here it is too smooth, but uh, look at this. For example, here. that when you apply the load it becomes linear but then it becomes a non linear so the non linearity part and then if you unload it you will see that it is not going to come back to its original position so when it is not coming to its original position that means some part of the energy is actually got dissipated by the plastic deformation and uh, which is essentially the and, and it is very likely that the plastic deformation is going to happen at the proximity of the indenter then away from this so the load in uh, load displacement plot is a very good indicator that the plastic deformation is actually undergoing uh, there under the indenter so another question is from velu vangala so he say he asks about the sample preparation difficulties and then the how would you make the sample how that will affect the so, data yeah. yeah first of all uh, sample preparation will affect your data and one of the uh, most important thing is like one of uh, your friend asked about the roughness so you have to have a, a smooth surface Uh, as much as possible but otherwise it is there is not very much difficulty as far as the sample preparation is concerned because i have given you the dimension so you have seen you can even a centimeter scale length scale uh, the sample and uh, minimum millimeter thickness which is not difficult only thing is that if you are working on the crystal and you want to do actually phase uh, identification or phase indexing you have to be very careful during the growth of the crystal to make sure you know which phase it is uh, your x which is y which is z and then accordingly we uh, bring it in here and then do the indentation okay that is that is very important when you are doing for the crystal but otherwise in general i do not think the indentation sample requirement is sample preparation is uh, that big a challenge uh, we have not faced that much okay you are muted uh, professor malaredi so, okay priyanka saini yeah she wants to know the reason behind the pile up yeah so pile up as i said pile up for different uh, materials it is different for uh, for polymers it is going to be different for organic crystals it is going to be different but but the general idea is that the 
the extent of plastic deformation around the indenter is significantly high, which leads to the out of train flow. That is the general thing. And now the how that out of flow happens, what plastic deformation happens depends on your system. For example, if it's a crystal, you it is more likely that it is that the slipping is actually happening this way. The slip planes are moving in that way. Where it is a it is a polymer, then it is a different. It is basically sometimes it is unraveling of the chains, or sometimes uh, it is the uh, the the crosslinks movements, the movements of the crosslinks and things like that that can actually lead to the uh, to the uh, to the pileup. But keep in mind the pileup is the very significant plastic deformation happening around this where it is going it is bound to go out of the surface and creates a surface like out of the plane and creates a surface like this so that's the general guideline but it depends then what system you are handling and based on that the mechanisms could be different okay uh, okay uh, we are about? yeah i think this is the last question so then we'll move uh, so Priya Pandey wants to know the solvate, uh, if you have volatile solvent, so how do you handle that? Displacement plot indicate any changes? Yeah, so that is very tricky. In the lattice. Right. So that's very tricky. I mean, uh, depends on what is the, uh, how, how volatile it is. Because every indentation takes certain time. And if it is, uh, it is, uh, it is within that time, the, it, is, it is volatile, then you may not be able to capture that. So that, that is a little tricky and that you have to actually work with your system and then see how much change, how much loss is that the solvent is happening and in what time. So that, uh, I think, uh, I think Dr. Asif can actually answer better uh, uh, based on the current situation about the timings part. But important thing is that mind, you keep in mind that between the indent, the two indent that you are doing, the time, whatever the minimum time that is required to, from one indent to the other indent, uh, you have to see that there's no significant loss in the solvent uh, in your system. That's what you have to keep in mind as a user. Okay, so there are several other questions. Manish, also, Manish has some questions. I think maybe we'll take it uh, with Asif. Yeah. So he wants to know how fracture affects the elastic modulus and hardness values. These are all very important. And then how opens yeah. uh, and also work. So all these, I think then we will probably take it with uh, Asif. So since we are running out of the time, so let us thank Piyush for this wonderful talk. And uh, so I think it has become very clear or you know, many things have become very clear. So thank you, uh, Piyush. Yeah. So now I invite Calvin uh, for uh, his talk. Uh, so Professor Malaredi and Pratyan, can I just use 10 seconds in this platform to, to just announce sure. one thing? So sure, uh, sure. I, I'll just tell that, you know, when I started my career as a faculty, uh, you know, I did not have the nano indenter. Okay. So I struggled to find, uh, to get my sample done. And there are places where you can pay and do it. Of course, there are places. But then you also need to know whether the idea that you have in your mind, whether it actually works or not before you start paying it, right? So if you, particularly my new colleagues who have joined recent department recently, or my some student friends, if you want to get some sample, send some sample to me to just get to see whether it is working or not, please feel free, please contact me. We will be happy to do free for you. It might take time depending on how much, uh, uh, how many samples we have and things like that. But I realized the importance of it when I started my career. So I would say that please contact me. We will be we will be happy to do some uh, initial investigation, and then if you feel it is worth going for it, you can go and get it done from somewhere uh, by through payment mode or something like that. But this is I realized from my career uh, when I started. So I thought uh, now it is time to actually make sure that others do not suffer. Okay. So really yeah, with that, thank you. With that, thank I, will, you. I, will, I, will, I will thank you once again to everybody, and I also my special thanks to uh, Professor Kiran from SRM who has helped me last night actually. You know, uh, in uh, understanding and educating me a little bit more about the organic crystals. So I thank all of you, and I really enjoyed this, and look forward to Kelvin's talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Kelvin. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, uh, very nice uh, uh, presentation. We should um, you, make my you, a little easier. Uh, let me share. So can you see my slide? Yes, yes. you can see. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. It's, a, it's, it's an honor to be able to share some of our research with you. And um, I actually uh, saw many familiar names, some friends and colleagues uh, I already know well. Um, I want to say Happy New Year to everyone. Um, so. Um, 
as uh, uh, Dr. Reddy said, is uh, my talk. My talk is mostly focused on application side of uh, nano indentation. So, uh, first, uh, uh, give you a brief introduction about the challenges in tablet development. Uh, this is a word that you know. The problem we're trying to solve through various effort, um, where the nano indentation is uh, used for tool we use. Um, then point out the possibility of solving those problems through crystal engineering, and then draw some of the brief conclusions. So you can uh, remember some of the key messages. So when you think about making a tablet, so you start with uh, some uh, pharmaceutical actives, and your goal is to get a, a tablet product with certain uh, functionality, certain performance. But from API to tablet, um, you have to use the excipients. Uh, rarely, if, if, if it's ever possible, you can just use API to make tablets. Um, so you need to use excipients and you mix with the API and uh, that's the formulation aspect. So then, you also need to consider, you have the materials now, have your API exceptions. Now you have to make them into the dosage form, the tablet. You have to apply various manufacturing processes, uh, including mixing, granulation, milling, compaction, um, even coating of tablets, and many other processes. Um, you know, there's many options. Um, people from industry should be very familiar with this. And the key point is, uh, you need to consider the material side, the formulation, also the process side. In order to make your final uh, product, the tool must be uh, considered simultaneously also. You cannot consider either one alone because your formulation affects the manufacturing process, vice versa. So the two must be considered simultaneously. You can imagine the number of variables you need to consider in order to develop uh, an optimum formulation. It's actually quite a, a daunting task. So because of this uh, challenge, uh, and also because we didn't have uh, a good enough knowledge uh, on materials and processes. So in the industry, um, historically people have been using more empirical approach to develop a tablet a formulation and pro manufacturing process. Uh, I think the situation has improved a lot in the past uh, decade, but still, the, a lot of uh, empirism still remains. Uh, we are still not there yet. Um, that's why it's a, a lot of more work to be done and by us, by many colleagues as well. So FDA, uh, maybe 20 years ago, re recognized these uh, uh, problems with uh, pharm pharmaceutical manufacturing, um, including tablets. So they propose this so-called quality by design approach. Um, they are, you know, uh, the, the idea is uh, okay. Now we know uh, while doing the uh, product development empirically is more like art and science. We want to transform this from art to science. Um, you know, the way we design product by trying different things and test it is more like a quality by luck. Uh, you don't really know the quality of the product um, until you test it. So the ideal uh, situation is so you really do it by based on science. It's a, you design the quality into your product. It's, it's so called a quality by design. But to achieve this transformation, uh, in my mind, uh, there are at least two things are required. First. Okay, I was earlier muted, yeah, but uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And the first thing is a fundamental understanding of both materials and processes because both has to be considered in order to design the final product. Um, the second uh, second consideration is the um, once you understand the system materials, you can start to apply appropriate engineering, um, including crystal engineering and particle engineering, to really uh, modify and improve the properties you want to achieve the kind of performance you want. And so this idea is uh, um, summarized in this uh, material science tetrahedron. So here we're considering four things, performance of your final product, property of the material you're, you're making, and structure of the material. So the relationship between structure, property, performance is uh, 
the basic you know, main idea of uh, any material science, you know, for pharmaceutics, uh, also for, uh, you know, battery, you know, for energy industry, anything you, uh, you can imagine. So this is the basic of all, when you deal with the material, you have to consider this structure properly performance. So once we know that we have, we have a very solid foundation, then when you run into a problem with a certain performance, you can start to apply uh, various processes. Basically, it's an engineering approach to solve the problem. By using the right uh, process, you, you can actually modify the structure and which leads to changed property and hopefully this to the improve the performance and overcoming the problem. So the engineering processes you can, uh, in pharmaceutical field, um, you can start with the API crystal engineering. So because uh, you know, all the excipients are supposedly to be relatively stable and uh, constant properties, but every API has different properties. So when you run into problems, likely the problem come from API. Therefore, um, we, um, API crystal engineering to fundamentally you know, change the property, to improve the property is very effective in that sense. And then if the API, API crystal engineering is not sufficient to overcome certain problems, you can also consider particle engineering. This is the second step you can consider. And then if that is still is not sufficient, sometimes you have your formulation developed, uh, you're, manuf you're making this product over maybe years, um, but all of a sudden you don't have the problems. Um, then you can already change the crystal, change the particle, uh, process and you have to consider the, the manufacturing process, so, such as when you're making tablets, the speed of the tabulating, you know, lubrication time, those kind of things. Um, but today's focus will be on API crystal engineering. So the main idea is that you have uh, various, uh, you know, for different projects, you have different APIs that exhibit, uh, you know, their own set, set of properties. And some are acceptable, some are not. But uh, if we understand the science behind it, the, understand the structure property relationship, now we can take each of the API, we can do the crystal engineering, we can produce engineered API to deliver the kind of properties we need. We can use those engineered API to make tablets. By doing this, um, you really uh, fix the problem at its root. Um, so you make all the API uh, uh, you know, kind of trouble free. So, you, so you therefore, uh, the efforts required for formulators to make the tablet is minimum. Um, of course, by doing the crystal engineering, we, we not only just uh, make the tablet um, um, compressible, also um, you can, it's an opportunity to improve many other properties such as solubility, taste of, the, uh, of, of your drug, many other properties. Um, so specifically on tableting, so there are many common problems in manufacturing of tablets. Uh, here, let's show some, some examples. Fracture of tablets, uh, lamination, uh, another uh, uh, form of lamination, and the capping. So here, capping is have a, just a cap, a, a piece of that fell off, uh, the remaining part is intact. So all these problems uh, present an issue with the quality. And so you will pass the uh, FDA's uh, uh, inspection. So we need to overcome this early on in development. So in order to do that, we need to really understand the uh, compacting process. So here's a very simplified way to think about this process. So you have the empty dye, and then you try to introduce the powder into the dye. So that's where the powder flow ability is an important consideration, but we don't consider this today. Um, but for manufacturing, it's important. Um, so once you fill the powder into your empty die, now you start to bring the two punches close together. Therefore, the, the volume will be reduced. Eventually, the particles are you know, pushed together and squeezed each in, in, into a, in a, a smaller volume that push against each other. That's where the stress is developed. And under stress, particles undergo deformation. And you, you, if you have a solid, a more dense uh, powder bed, and then once you remove the pressure, because in comparison, you apply pressure, remove it, fill the powder, do it again, right? So once you remove the pressure, on the zero compression pressure, um, uh, the particles can undergo uh, elastic recovery. If the particles are elastic, that means the deformation is uh, reversible, it's elastic deformation. 
therefore the particles will separate from each other. You can still get, have a loose uh, uh, powder and the tablet is not very dense, you know, very strong. But on the other hand, if the material is uh, uh, purely plastic, that means the deformation of the particles uh, is uh, permanent. So they get uh, stuck together, they remain stuck together. In this case, the tablet is dense and usually strong. And then once you make the tablet, you need to push it out of the eye so you can fill the powder and make a, a second tablet. In that case, you can imagine when you push the tablet halfway out of the dye. So uh, outside the dye, the, the portion of the tablet uh, is uh, free from any constraint by a dye wall. So that can they tend to expand laterally. So you can see the dimension change can cause the shear stress within the tablet. So if the tablet doesn't have enough uh, mechanical strength, this can cause lamination, capping, the kind of issues. So this is actually like a more uh, max, um, uh, microscopic uh, view. Now let's look at the microscopic uh, view, the a single particle level. Imagine you have two particles uh, on the stress that will deform, and uh, um, the deformation can be either elastic, reversible, or plastic, irreversible. So you can imagine uh, if it's elastic, um, after decompression, after you remove the pressure, the contact area between two particles is still very small. Therefore, you can see, you know, it's easy to separate them. Therefore, the tablet is not very strong. But on the other hand, if it's the plastic deformation, the bonding area between particles remain uh, intact and that will give you a uh, large bonding area, therefore potentially strong tablets. Uh, from this uh, um, cartoon, we can say um, adequate plasticity it's necessary for forming strong tablets, but it's not by itself is not sufficient because even you have a large bonding area between particles, but if the bonding itself is weak, you still don't get a very strong tablet. And so this idea is captured uh, by this uh, bonding area, bonding strength uh, interplane uh, model we have uh, proposed, uh, short for BABS. Um, Basically, you want to have a combination of uh, a reasonable bonding area and bonding strength to get, give you a strong um, tablet. If you say bonding area is very small, you don't have a strong tablet. Or if the bonding strength is very small, you also don't get a very strong tablet. So imagine you have API here, we use the silica, the sand, loose sand that don't, under normal pressure, we use the making tablets that don't make, they don't form tablets. Um, so if you mix with uh, a polymer, a pharmaceutical recipients, PVP, you can see that um, the amount of PVP up to the 20% into the mixture, it still doesn't help you to make intact tablets. And you require at least the 40% in this case to form an intact tablets, but it's not very strong. And if you use a 60%, you can make strong tablets. So um, we, Normally, we apply this uh, to make Pascal as the, uh, the strength we want to achieve. And then when you make tablets, if you doesn't mean you have to reach this strength to make a, 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 a tablet with acceptable strength. But uh, if you do have this strength, you can most likely um, don't have the, any worry about uh, uh, sufficient strength. So we use the to make Pascal as a sort of a conservative uh, criteria for uh, strength of tablets. You can see even up to the 60% uh, exceeding the PVP, the strength is still not as strong as what we desire. So this just says, uh, um, just a simple mixing, the formulation approach, this is you know, a traditional approach, it doesn't work very effectively to overcome tabulating problem. So now we're gonna say, how do we do this more effectively? We do that through the crystal engineering. So this is the early work, um, actually in fact, is the earliest work I've done on, uh, along this line. So the, here we have, we see the two polymorphs of sulfamerazin. So in the form one, the molecules are packed into flat and rigid layers. It's rigid because the molecules are packed in this way, as so it's uh, 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 interwoven. And also they have a, a hydrogen bond. So it's a rigid hydrogen bonded, two dimensional hydrogen bond network. So you can imagine like a, a stack of cars. If you shear it, it's very easy uh, to do that. Um, for the version of form two, um, it's also layered, it's also hydrogen bonded layer, but the layer is not flat. So you can see the zigzag, um, therefore the slide is difficult, except if we go slide a crystal into the screen. 
Um, but for from one, you can slide a, a two, a two, a two, these two dimensional flat layers in any direction. So from one is supposedly to be more uh, uh, plastic than from two. If you consider this as a BABS model, I just mentioned earlier, so from one is more plastic and because they have the same chemistry, same molecule, you can imagine the bonding strength won't differ by much. Therefore, you can expect from one, the more plastic crystal should give you better tabletability, which is the case. So this blue curve is the tabletability of form one. These red curves are for form two. Um, they, they are different in, in terms of the particle size. So these uh, red circles are form two, but with smaller particle size. Therefore, they have given you a larger bonding area between particles. You can see the slightly increased uh, tabletability. So <clears throat> later on, um, you know, they, uh, 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 Mala actually very nicely demonstrated this, um, um, the difference in crystal structure can have an impact on mechanical property. So early in my submarine work was more um, speculation. We see the tabletability, we see the crystal structure, but the missing link is a mechanical property. But the Mala very nicely demonstrated that. So this uh, uh, for this compound, uh, form one, you can see that just like the uh, form one uh, sulfamerian polymorph, it forms a flat layered uh, hydrogen bonded structure. Um, th therefore, you can expect this one to be uh, plastic soft. Uh, form three is also layers, but this layer is hydrogen bonded, but it's not flat. You can see this coma like structure with the, um, the branches of the molecules extending out of the plane. And therefore, the physical hindrance will prevent easy slide between the uh, layers. Um, because the difference uh, in crystal structure, the form one, um, you can actually, if you poke it with needles, you, this deform very easily. And this deformation is uh, permanent, therefore, it's uh, a plastic. Um, but if you get a form of three, it doesn't behave this way. It's more brittle, it's hard, more resistant to uh, external stress. Um, the different mechanical properties in form one being more plastic leads to different tabletability. So when you look at this data, here's the tensile strength as a function of pressure. So for both, you know, with increasing pressure, the, you can make stronger tablets. So this curve increases. But for form three, the harder material, it continues to increase. But form one, but in the beginning for, for the form three, the strength is not very high. Uh, for form one, at low pressure, you can already get a much stronger tablets because form one is more plastic. Therefore, the larger bonding area will be developed more easily than form three. And this uh, uh, strength increase um, uh, sharply with the, uh, I don't know why you have these uh, uh, lines there. Uh, Anila, can you don't do anything? Can you please do, uh, 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 annotate? Okay. So uh, here, uh, sorry about that. There's some problem with the system, I think. Uh, one of these uh, participants is uh, doing something. I somehow you affects my uh, slides. Um, okay. So, uh, Calvin, maybe you can unshare and share it. Okay, let me try that, yeah. Yes. Yes, this is better. Thank you. Yeah, please don't touch anything. Just listen. And if you want to take notes, put the notes on a piece of paper. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in this case, you can see the strength increase sharply for Form 1, the, uh, the soft plastic crystal. But then you reach a plateau very quickly. You know, here, the above the 50 megapascal, the strength doesn't increase much anymore. So this is a characteristic of uh, a plastic material because when you compress it, it deforms very easily, but then the whole powder bed consolidates and reach a maximum. Therefore, even you apply further uh, in a larger stress, there's no more space for particle to undergo deformation to develop bonding area. That's why it reached this plateau. Versus the for form three, uh, it continues to increase because of the higher press you apply, the pressure you apply, the more deformation will occur. So, um, so that's for the, uh, the polymorphs. Uh, you can also achieve similar effects just by using other solid forms. Here shows uh, uh, one example of hydrates uh, for the um, p hydroxy benzoic acid. So for anhydrate, this is crystal structure. You can see the 
Um, this is energy framework. Uh, this shows uh, the dimer of this molecule. They have the complementary hydrogen bonds. Therefore, the interaction is strong. You can treat this uh, dimer as a single unit. So this is a, a solid piece. And they are connected you know, with the neighboring dimers uh, you know, uh, through the um, also hydrogen bonds. But hydrogen bonds are not as strong as the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the complementary hydrogen bonds. But idea is that this one from a layer, which is has, uh, you know, it doesn't slide very easily you know, for if you consider this uh, um, as the sleep line. Uh, we look at the hydrate, um, just visually, you can see, oh, this may be a sleep line. But when you look at the interaction energy, actually, it's not the case. The one, uh, one zero zero being is uh, the, the, uh, the molecule in this plane, they interact strongly. Um, but uh, between the layer, between these plants, is uh, that's a weak interaction. So actually, this one is a sleep line. 100 zero zero for the hydrate, but the uh, corresponding sleep line here, uh, you know, has hydrogen bond. You can see these uh, interaction energies. So from this, you can see the um, for the hydrate, these sleep lines can be moved, can slide more easily. Therefore, it is more plastic, and uh, and this leads to different uh, uh, tablet ability. So for the hydrate, you can see that you can obtain much stronger tablet than anhydrate because of different mechanical property. Um, so you can also achieve this uh, uh, different uh, mechanical property by using um, you know, co-crystallization. This is one example is the caffeine metal gallet. Um, so the blue line is a metal gallet. It doesn't give you a very strong tablet. Um, the reason for that is that the crystal, um, the, the, the molecules packed into the um, three-dimensional structure, which has the you know, undergo hydrogen bonding with the neighboring molecules to form a three-dimensional uh, hydrogen bond network. So there's no obvious uh, a weak plan to allow the sleep uh, to occur. Um, but when you make the uh, cork crystal with the caffeine, uh, you can get this red trace. It's, uh, therefore, the cork crystal is much improved. The reason for that is that uh, the molecules now uh, are packed into the layered structure. Uh, within the layer is rigid, it's hydrogen bonded, it's flat. Therefore, it's more plastic, uh, which corresponds to the better tabulability. If you think about the model we described, um, to give you a larger bonding area in this case. So um, we also look at this. Uh, so far, we haven't talked about the orientation yet, but we'll get there now. So for the theophylline, we also, uh, because theophylline only differ from the caffeine uh, in one functional group. So caffeine, here's a, the methyl group, here's the hydrogen. So they are structure similar. We thought uh, you we, we, we should have the uh, coke crystal forming with the methyl gallet as well. It did. Therefore, we make the material, study the compaction property. You can see the uh, from methyl gallet to the coke crystal is much improved similar to the metal gallet uh, caffeine coke crystal. But when you compare the theophylline with coke crystal, it's opposite. Actually, when you form the coke crystal, the tabulability is reduced. Um, so one idea is that uh, um, coke crystallization can change the properties, but the changes are not always desirable. So if the theophylline, in this case, your API, if you, for whatever reason, you make a coke crystal with metal gallet, to improve other properties. But then in this case, you actually risk losing tabulability. So that's a very important point to recognize that when you do crystal engineering, we need to consider many properties. You know, you solve one problem, it cannot you know, lead other problems. Basically, the solution cannot be worse than the problem itself. The reason for that coming to the uh, net orientation is uh, um, um, Actually, the theophylline exhibit the lowest hardness, means it's more plastic. So these data were obtained by the annotation. You can see the theophylline is 0.28 gigapascal, and co-crystal is 0.78 gigapascal, and uh, uh, sorry, co-crystal is 0.48, and metal gallet is, uh, is 0.78 gigapascal. So uh, the, the ranking of the uh, tabulability it corresponds with the ranking of the hardness very well. The, the lower harness, softer crystal, larger boundary, uh, larger boundary area can be developed on, during compaction, therefore um, stronger tablet. Um, so the reason for that is uh, we look at this, uh, um, this uh, um, coke crystal with uh, theophylline, metal gallet, 
it's similar to the caffeine metal guide. It's also layer structure is flat. That's not a surprising. For the theophylline, we see the flat layers. But the layer is not a, a two-dimensional two hydrogen bond network. Actually, it consists of uh, uh, columns. You can basically, um, these V-shaped molecules, you can imagine it goes into the screen, uh, you know, form a chain, hydrogen bound, uh, one-dimensional one chain. And that V-shaped, uh, if you look at it from this angle, that's taken to form the uh, 2D layer. So therefore, uh, not only the layers can slide, also, the, the columns, molecular columns, can also slide uh, on the stress. So it actually, it's easier to move because the, the, the smaller number of molecules are involved in order to induce the permanent deformation. And neighboring layers, actually, this layer also has a similar structure, except the orientation of the column is dif differs by uh, 110 degree, roughly 110 degree. That means if you rotate the crystal into the screen by 110 uh, degree, you will see this layer. It looks like it's just like this one. Therefore, this is a multiple directions molecule can slide uh, to, to accommodate the stress, therefore, they induce a plastic deformation. That's why this crystal is very plastic. Okay, another example is the pure CKM saccharine co crystal. Uh, so, here you can see that um, saccharine gives you um, a very good tableability, but co crystal is actually the worst. Um, um, the pure CKM is not good, but co crystal is worse. The reason for that is that, again, it corresponds to their different mechanical property, which can be studied by the uh, nano indentation. So here in the table, you can see the hardness, which is a measure of uh, plasticity. Um, hardness of the um, saccharine is the lowest among the three. And um, pyrosicum is uh, higher, and cochlear is highest. That's why, again, the ranking here, uh, in terms of the uh, hardness, uh, correspond to the ranking of the tableability. Um, I want to point out this yield strength. Uh, earlier, that's one question about how do you de determine the elastic or plastic region in their indentation. So we can do that um, by doing so-called a partial loading and loading experiment. So imagine the um, initially at a low low load, um, the deformation of the crystal on the indenter is elastic. That means if you apply small load, you let it go. The crystal didn't undergo any permanent deformation, so if you become recovered to the original shape and size, so you can do this repeatedly. You won't change the you know the response. The curve will remain the same, right? Same traits going back and forth, um, which, which was showed earlier. Now, when the uh, load applied gradually increase, at some point you will see it, it, you know it starts to see the deviation. That indicates the occurrence of the permanent deformation. The sample start to change. And then from that measurement, we can determine what's the maximum load and therefore the stress corresponding to the uh, onset of plastic deformation. So from that measurement, we can determine the so-called the yield strength of the material. Uh, it, it, it can, we can obtain this way, um, which you can see the more plastic crystal with the lower hardness also have the lower uh, yield strength. Um, Okay, the, the, the reason for that, if you look at the crystal structure for saccharin, you can see the very nice uh, flat layers, these hydrogen bonded rigid layers, just like uh, as the example that we showed earlier. Um, but for the uh, purosicam, you can see layers, but the layers actually, one thing is not flat, you can see these, uh, uh, the, the layers are interdigitated. So that's uh, you know, not uh, completely separated. And also, that's a strong interaction uh, between layers. So that's why this crystal is not very plastic. And when you look at this, uh, the core crystal, uh, they also see layers, but layers also not plastic, not flat. And also, the, uh, that's the interaction, the, uh, the hydrogen bonds um, uh, between layers, which you, they all prevent the easy slip between layers. That's why these two crystals are not very plastic. Um, you can also do the uh, modified structure by forming salts. Uh, here's one example. Uh, we are all familiar with uh, uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen. Um, it's high dose drug. It doesn't form strong tablets. Um, you can still see here this form one um, uh, paracetamol. Uh, it, you know, if it's just tablet strength is very weak. This is zero. You know, when you apply high pressure, it actually doesn't help. It causes a lamination problem. But the low pressure is strength, strength is very uh, very low. Um, but if you make a salt out of this drug, uh, you can uh, make a, a hydrochloride salt. It's a, actually it's a monohydrate. Um, 
when you do that, you can see the, uh, the crystal structure is, you can see the uh, layer structure um, is hydrogen bonded. It's uh, uh, the overall is, uh, you know, there's no interdigitation, you can slide uh, easily. And this will correspond to a better plasticity. That means that we should have, we should have a lower harness, which is the case. And by using the nano indentation, we see the um, harness of uh, this, this salt is about half of the harness of the uh, um, um, acetaminophen crystal. So everything, so far everything is, uh, you know, uh, we have a um, we have model, we have a, um, a set of theory, they all uh, you know, uh, worked out so far. Um, another case is the uh, metaforming. Uh, this is more like a close uh, in API. In the, you know, you, I want to show this. Uh, when you have a problem with a drug, what can you do um, to fix it? You know, to bring this more closer to reality um, instead of just an uh, academic exercise. So metformin is a first line drug for um, type two, uh, type two, type two diabetes. Um, in the uh, commercial tablet, we uh, people use a high uh, hydrochloride salt, um, but uh, we want to use a different form to make a, a new product. The reason is uh, um, we want to develop a uh, already disintegrating tablet um, because uh, uh, this is. Uh, a certain population, maybe the elderly or um, uh, young kids that don't like swallowing tablets or having difficulty doing that. So if you uh, put a tablet in the mouth, uh, they would dis disintegrate you know, uh, in, in the mouth uh, by in contact with saliva, they can swallow very easily. Um, you know, when people are traveling, maybe they don't have access to water, they still need to take the medicine, so they can do it uh, using this kind of tablets. Um, but, uh, it, the goal is nice, but we have challenges. For one thing, the drug is, uh, uh, doesn't have a very good taste. And then you put it on the tongue, you try it once, you may never want to try it again. It's salty, it's bitter. Um, the drug is a high dose. Um, commercial um, tablet has two strengths. One is a 250 milligram, one is 500 milligram. They're relatively high. Imagine you put some tablet, you sleep in the air, you know, the formal tablets, quickly the tablets become large. It's so large, you maybe you don't want to swallow it. And unfortunately, this drug also has a very poor tablability and flowability. So we need to address them. And this is a, what the crystal looks like, very nice. Um, so the way we took it, we, we, we engineered a crystal is uh, by form of salt with uh, artificial sweetener. In this case, it's the uh, acid Um That do form salt, this is the base, this is the acid, um, this is the crystal. And uh, the crystal looks not uh, as elongated as the hydrochloride salt, therefore the flow should be improved. It, it did, but this is not the focus of this uh, talk today. Um, so look at the test. So the, the drug alone, this is a, a open bars there for the, uh, this is a um, number of people uh, uh, tells the test of this uh, material, right? This is a number, larger number means a very bitter, is uh, offensive. The uh, uh, lower number means uh, no, the wine means sweet. You can see the uh, majority of people feel it's uh, bitter with the uh, hydrochloride salt, but the majority of people feel it's sweet for the uh, antisulfate salt. It's uh, quite successful um, in this sense to, in terms of the modifying uh, the test of the drug. Um, but the focus of uh, uh, our talk today is actually our mechanical property. So we look at this uh, uh, tablability, it turns out this uh, uh, acetosophium salt is also much better than hydrochloride salt. And this means the challenge for, to formulation will be much reduced right? because the API itself exhibit uh, much improved tablability. You don't need to worry too much about you know, keeping the tablet intact with adequate strength by using a lot of excipients. Um, the reason for that is uh, uh, this, you, you, if you look at you know, any, uh, the mechanical property of these two crystals, uh, the um, acetosophium salt exhibit both a low or lower harness and lower elastic uh, modulus than the hydrochloride salt. Uh, that means that this salt is uh, um, more plastic than the hydrochloride salt. That's why it, it, it exhibit uh, better tablability. So um, we have done uh, quite, a, quite a lot of uh, nano indentation on uh, pharmaceutical um, crystals. 
So in, in this paper, actually, we um, summarize this work, uh, um, literature data, and also data from our own lab. You can see the mechanical property of organic molecules uh, you know, can vary over a very wide range. You can see that from a very, very soft, you know, this uh, based on the Young's modulus, um, you know, the very compliant to very hard. It's, uh, you know, doesn't comply at all, uh, almost like some metals. Um, not well, some hard materials. Um, and so they for both young, uh, uh, young modulus and uh, harness. And when you plot this uh, the modulus versus harness, you can see uh, the distribution. Uh, you know, for one thing, they both have cover a very wide range. Other things, uh, the two parameters actually has a, a nearly linear correlation. Um, so we have shown this with some other materials and some other uh, techniques uh, for the bulk powders. Uh, something we can talk more about if you're interested. Um, but my thing is, uh, um, I want to mention is um, uh, molecular crystals can exhibit very different mechanical properties, and those can be very nicely characterized by um, nano indentation. And those difference in mechanical property has an influence on tabulating. So this is the key message. So I'll uh, wrap up. Um, so. Today we only showed a, you know, a, a small window into this uh, wonderful world of material science and crystal engineer. So basically, uh, when we try to develop a product, uh, also in research, I think the material science tetrahedron is a very useful tool in terms of to, to guide your thinking of research. So you approach the problem, you know, identify the nature of the problem, the performance, and then try to figure out what the property affects that and what kind of structure is required to get the property you need. And then you can apply the engineering, um, either crystal engineering, particle engineering, and other things, uh, you can try to get a goal uh, you want to achieve. This is very effective, very, um, uh, you know, um, uh, for me, it's very useful for our research. Hopefully you can apply the idea in your work also. Um, so in terms of this tabulating, um, the BABS model, BABS interplay, bounding area, bounding strength interplay, uh, uh, um, it's a very important. Uh, it's a very simple idea, but once you apply it, you know, everything you can you can uh, explain a lot of things. Um, and uh, um, when you run into problems with the tabulating of your drug or formulation, think about maybe you don't have adequate plasticity. Um, then the way to improve that is uh, to do crystal engineering and some other techniques, maybe you know, particle engineering. Um, but if you if you understand and quantify plasticity, um, nano indentation is a powerful technique. It's not the only technique, but it's a um, it's a very useful technique. If you have access to it, uh, you know, by all means try it. Uh, you, you're gonna benefit a lot from it. So before I finish and take questions, I like to um, thank uh, people who have uh, contributed to to the work I showed. Uh, my former advisor, uh, the late professor, uh, Dr. Grant, um, he led me to this uh, wonderful world of uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical crystals and compaction uh, of powders. And uh, my collaborators and P uh, uh, my lab, lab members that have contributed to, to the various projects, um, I presented today. Um, uh, also my other friends and colleagues who are, some, some of you are on the, uh, joining us today. And of course, without the support from uh, these companies and organizations, it's not possible for us to get this work done. It's quite expensive to do research. Um, and so I want to thank them for their generous support. Um, I also thank you for your uh, care, for carefully listening, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Calvin, for the wonderful talk, and then uh, for taking us through, you know, the structure mechanical property correlationship, and then uh, various things like how you can handle, uh, you know, issues, uh, and then how you can understand from the uh, crystal structure and the mechanical properties. Thank you very much for that. So uh, we have some time for questions. So, uh, uh, so I let you actually ask the questions directly. So Vasilu, can you ask? He has a couple of questions. Vaslu, are you there? Srini? Hi. Yes, Mala, can you hear? Yes, yes. yes I hear you. Hi, Vaslu. Uh, yes. uh, hi, Calvin. How are you? Good, good. Uh, uh, nice to meet you virtually. Yes. Uh, okay. The, that was a nice talk. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is actually, um, 
so far whatever uh, uh, you know papers i read right so generally they take the structure and nano uh, they take a crystal and nano intent and then they correlate the property with the structure so arrangement of the molecules all this is so uh, are there like uh, literature examples or or anyone try to compare the nano intuition results of amorphous uh, material with the crystalline api for example in the tablets for example you make a uh, tablet with amorphous api and also tablet with a with its crystalline counterpart then how the properties will change yeah uh, answer is yes and in fact we have been studying that uh, manish oh. online and he's uh, currently working on projects on that we publish some work um, on that as well. You know, uh, people uh, in pharma pharmaceutical industry they use uh, amorphous salt dispersion to um, overcome a poor solubility problem. Uh, so, but then you had to make them into tablet. Uh, so, uh, the mechanical property of amorphous material is equally important uh, for you know for those kind of uh, materials. Yeah. Uh, in terms of comparison, uh, we have not done the head-to-head -head comparison yet. But imagine um, the mechanical property of the crystals vary so much from uh, you know like wide range from low to high. Um, my my thinking is that for for glasses, is probably uh, the range of the variability is much narrower. So crystal can be this much, more from maybe within this range. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer to to say that for sure, we need to do a lot of work. You know. Get a lot of seasons, just like what we did with the um, crystals. You have to collect data to um, then to compare them, right? Then maybe we'll do that uh, maybe after five years. I don't know. We don't have enough work data on the amorphous system yet, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, we are actively working on that. Um, I hope you know once this uh, in, in, in the, the technology is widely available, people are interested in developing amorphous drugs can also consider that as a mechanical property of uh, amorphous materials. It's something high on our mind. We have been working on that and, um, and we are still actively pursuing this. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a, uh, one more small question. Uh, has anyone looked into applications of nano in uh, uh, for analysis of pharmaceutical gels, for example, topical you know, formulations? Oh, uh, I'm not aware of that because uh, I, I didn't look for it. Um, I mm -hmm. imagine uh, it can be done, uh, you know, because uh, the gel is that they don't have a very strong, uh, high strength, right? Yes. So therefore, you want to have a very low uh, load, and uh, where it, you can still monitor the penetration depth, everything. I think the um, if you have the right tip, um, mm -hmm. and it should be very, you know, the inventor the, 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 the should be a very nice. Uh, a technique to use to study mechanical property of gels, uh, especially have the DMA dynamic mechanical analysis. You know, is particularly useful for gels. Um, I think that you know maybe the expert uh, um, uh, yeah. a, a can you know, <laughs> Syed can 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 give yeah, you more. So uh, in my in my talk, I'll I'll have a couple of slides uh, showing that uh, it can be done. Okay. Uh, but not directly okay. in gel, but PDMS and contact lens, which are similar to gels. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, there is another question from Professor Bansal. I think I am not sure if he's going to ask. So maybe yeah. I can ask. But you Professor can, Bansal, you do you ahead. want to ask directly? Okay, I will ask. Yeah. Uh, so he says that you know what you are looking at is at the molecular level, uh, crystalline level, you know, single particle level, nano orientation data. So then when you go to the powder compaction and tablet, so it's a random orientation of the particles. So how do you account for it? And then yes. how do you basically you don't have access to the indentation data on all the faces? That's what he says. Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, this was asked earlier also. Um, so my thought is this: um, for one thing. Um, we, we need to understand, uh, yeah, we recognize uh, the, the mechanical property is not isotropic, um, but we also need to ask uh, how much difference, you know, uh, um, from different directions, right? So typically when we do the measurement, we do the, uh, we use the you know, dominant phase. That means the property of the uh, bulk powder will be somehow dominated by that phase. You see more of that in the powder. Um, other things that uh, you know, during the uh, powder compaction, um, the stress is actually 
um, think just, just like a water, you know, water, but you know, you still have the hydrostatic stress in there. You apply a normal load, the stress will be, will be distributed to the side of the you know, of the tablet, right, hitting the wall. That's why you apply the, the uh, uh, actual stress. You can measure the die wall stress can be substantial. Sometimes can be eighty percent of the load you apply. What I'm saying, I'm saying that you know, um, the stress in the part of the bed during compaction is not a uh, unidirectional. It's, you can imagine it's everywhere, you know, all directions, just like a, a liquid. That means uh, your crystal may be oriented in different ways in the dye, but uh, you're gonna, uh, the crystal, the three planes, the weakest plane in the crystal can still experience stress um, on the compaction. Uh, I mean, there'll be some influence, but uh, um, if you uh, determine the dominant phase of, you know, two crystals, one is much lower hardly than the other. And the chances that that one should give, it should behave more plastically during compaction for the two reasons I mentioned, you know, you were mentioning the dominant phase. And I think we have tried to look at this, uh, you, um, maybe, I don't know, five or six systems. Um, so the percentage difference may be somewhere from, you know, 1% to 30% in terms of the measured harness. Um, I think that we can look into more carefully, even just a hundred percent difference. That you make you make a measurement on one crystal, you look at uh, maybe the biggest difference in other phases will be maybe double the amount or half of that. And then other crystal, uh, maybe something similar, but overall, maybe the average is still, you know, when you measure it uh, on one crystal, get a, a lower harness, you can, um, the chances it probably is okay. You know, it's, it, it, um, you know, the overall property of the crystal, even in the dye, is still be lower, uh, more plastic. I, uh, to add to your answer, actually, you see, most of the time, if the crystal is very anisotropic, so the crystal, the, you know, the phase that is very weak, you know, so that will lead to a major phase. So most of the time you have that softest phase available to you. And if it is very anisotropic, so anyway, yes. you're going to catch it. But if it is very isotropic, then you have access to then it doesn't matter because whatever phase you measure, it will be close to the weakest plane. So that's how somehow we are lucky to actually have the crucial information uh, with even just uh, one or two phases most of the time. Yeah, yeah um, yes. But uh, other things, yeah, um, two more points there. Is, uh, thank you for adding to this. Uh, one thing is that when the um, crystal is uh, say not isotropic, the, the crystal are not uh, also uh, you know, e equal dimensional. And those crystal tend to break you know, um, you know, when you're doing compaction, that will somehow uh, reduce the level of anisotropy of the powder, uh, you know, in the dye. Um, the second thing is, uh, in the future, actually, uh, some people are doing this. Uh, we can, you know, when the computer, um, computational power is uh, enough, we can do modeling. Uh, in fact, we are able to calculate uh, Young's modulus of uh, crystals from structure. We know the uh, anisotropy, you, know, you can even introduce uh, a, 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 um, an isotropy index you know, to see the maximum strength Young's modulus versus lowest for a given crystal is by, you know, maybe sometimes two, sometimes, you know, uh, you can get an index there for, uh, using com, com, uh, com, computed results. Um, so I think that, yeah, we are lucky, uh, but also that's a reason for the luck we have. So I think we're probably okay, um, but more work needs to be done, so. Um, we'll keep asking some questions until we are able to solve it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, Calvin, I think we are uh, I don't done. One more. One more question. Have, so yeah, maybe this is the last one. Okay. okay. Last so question. there's a question from Sun Pharmaceutical from Basmang. Uh, I mean, Basmang, if you want to go live, it's okay. You can ask directly. Uh, yes, please. Basmang, you want you have to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, he has posted the question earlier, actually, in the first talk. Uh, I just thought it. So he he's asking basically, is it necessary that the tip of indenter should be smaller than single particle? Whose properties to be measured? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, definitely. Yeah. There's no doubt. Yep. Okay. And uh, 
since it was a quick one, there is one more, uh, a good one. How we can control nano denter during thermomechanical responses on organic crystal in real time because of problems associated with macroscopic motion during course of heating. This is from Dr. Samajit Ghosh. Um, well, you, maybe, maybe, we can leave it, maybe we can, we can leave it to Asif, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I, I, just, I just give one comment there. Uh, when you yeah, do this, sure. uh, when you do the, uh, the thermal mechanical property, yeah, talking about, uh, actually Manishi did some work before, right? Um, you can you have a, uh, you can control temperature. You put the crystal on hot stage. Uh, you what you wait until temperature reaches the equilibrium. But the idea is to do the nano indentation. The sample has to be fixed. Sample itself cannot move during the course of indentation. Yep. So um, so we're not talking about the jumping, you know, moving of crystals. So you hit it, you equilibrize the temperature. Then just uh, measure the uh, mechanical property as usual, right? Only thing is the temperature different. Um, then you may have difference, uh, you know, uh, uh, young modulus and harness. So I think that uh, uh, those are being in the um, side actually, they can talk about a lot more about that, right? In during the design of experiments, you have the heat shield, make sure that, you know, the thermal uh, uh, expansion of the tip is, is uh, accounted for those kind of things. Um, um, you know, we have to trust those guys. Yeah. Yep. Sure. I think we are good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Kelvin. Yep. Bye bye. Oh no. What? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'll stay. I'll stay. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot for the. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, so now we move to the next talk. Uh, Asif. So the. So this is from the man who actually builds this instrument. So and also there are a lot of new inventions and uh, developments. So I request Asif to uh, now present. Asif. Okay, thank you, Mala. Uh, I think everybody can see my slide and then I am audible. Yes. I just wanted to confirm. Yes. Okay, that's pretty good. So, Kevin, uh, yeah, thank, thank you for uh, Mala. You can't, yeah, I don't know, for some reason, uh, my camera is not coming up. So, I tried before. So, I, I think I'll leave it. You can see me on this picture. So, that is who, we, who I am. <laughs> And uh, 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 thanks, Mala and, and, and Pratyang uh, for organizing this. This has been very wonderful. And also uh, to Pritush and, 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 and Kelvin uh, for, for a wonderful talk uh, that kind of uh, uh, reduces my bar. Uh, uh, I, I don't have to go through all the fundamentals, but I can still uh, kind of uh, contribute and show what all the uh, tools that is available. And I will go through that. Uh, keeping in mind, and the, the most of the audience are, uh, uh, are new to this field, so I'll try to keep it uh, light and simple. So uh, with that, I will like to move forward. Uh, and in this this particular work, uh, most of it is what I am going to present uh, was done uh, at uh, Hyzotron uh, many years ago, uh, and then uh, at Brooker later. Now, one thing is, I, I don't know, most of people uh, in the audience probably the, they don't know. Uh, I was working for uh, Hyzotron for more than 20 years uh, as a R&D director. Uh, and during that period, uh, we developed all this instrumentation and, and then later with Brooker. Uh, and now I am I'm associated with uh, uh, Industron and uh, I'm continuing this work. So with that, uh, let me get into the topics. Uh, so, uh, before I jump into uh, 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 on the instrumentation part of it, uh, uh, let me touch up a few things. I think most of it has been covered by uh, Pijush. And uh, the one thing that I would like to stress here is that uh, why we do this uh, nanomechanical, uh, why particularly nanometer length scale? Uh, somebody asked this question earlier. It is mainly because of uh, structure property correlations. Uh, whatever that you see in the bulk response, somehow it is controlled at a, a very small length scale. And at present, the only length scale that, that to the, uh, the least we can do uh, some quantitative studies about uh, nanometer length scale. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and, and from there, we try to understand the mechanics and then we can kind of uh, correlate our, our uh, related to how the material behaves in, in bulk form. That is one of the motivation. So most of it is for structure property correlation. So I don't want to dwell more on that. That, that is one of the reasons why we do this nanomechanical studies using uh, a, a, this kind of technology, okay? 
So uh, then, then next is, I think, uh, uh, Pijush gave a pretty nice uh, uh, animation of uh, nano inundation. Uh, I would like to show that actually in, in, in real, uh, this particular thing uh, uh, is being done inside a scanning electron microscope. Uh, so I'm going to go show on a video uh, of, of this nano inundation and that you can see. Where you can see here, there is a tip, which is a diamond tape approaching and making contact on a sample beneath and doing an indent and then uh, by loading and then you're unloading, leaving a small uh, dent on the surface. This is what we are calling about uh, nano inundation. So while doing that, you also get this load and displacement curve. You, you apply the load as a function of uh, uh, displacement and you measure the uh, load displacement response. And from this low displacement curve, you get uh, properties. You can kind of uh, measure the uh, uh, unloading stiffness. And, and then uh, from that, you calculate the modulus and hardness. Uh, the most important quantity that you would like to know is what is the contact size. And Pijush uh, clearly went through that. So I don't want to go through it again. So there are formulations that you can use to measure this uh, contact size. So. Uh, the, the, the information that you get is for a given load, what is the depth? And from the depth, you, you, you figure out what is the contact size by knowing the geometry of the probe and, and some calibration procedure. So these are all well established. So I don't have to go through uh, again. And uh, uh, that now we can go and do uh, uh, inundation to measure the mechanical response of the material. And then uh, and, and, and then from that, we can go and uh, do whatever that we need to do with respect to understanding the mechanics or just measuring the property of the material, okay? So, and uh, so now, how do we do this? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, this is important to understand uh, as there was a couple of questions in the talk. Uh, so uh, the point is basically, if you have a transducer and if you have a way of, uh, applying and measuring the forces that you apply as well as the displacement that, uh, that, that uh, in, in, during the inundation experiment. And then, then uh, you can use that uh, to generate this low displacement curve. But to generate the forces, uh, there are various ways of you can achieve uh, uh, by doing electromagnetic uh, actuations uh, that is passing a current to a magnetic field uh, and, and generating force are by uh, electrostatic means. What I mean by is basically, uh, when you apply a voltage, a high voltage uh, between two parallel plates, uh, you generate a very high electrostatic force uh, and that force can be used to apply force onto the sample. So in, in most of the talk that I am going to present and and, and, uh, and Pichuj and then the Kelvin uh, uh, the speakers presented, uh, the way we generated force was basically through electrostatic force actuation. Uh, and it's very simple. Basically, you have a parallel plate geometry and you apply a voltage. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, this is a three plate capacitance structure. The center plate is being suspended by a spring and it, it is free to move in between these two outer plates. Now, if you apply a high voltage to the bottom plate, it will attract the center plate to, towards it and that generate the force and that force is being applied onto the sample. Okay, that is how the force has been applied. And it is basically a very simple formula. Uh, the force generated is basically a uh, constant times voltage square. So you know what the voltage that you are applying. So from that, you can calculate what the force is, okay? So that is as simple as, it, uh, as you can uh, get. Now you can also put some control algorithm. How do you control this voltage to control the force? So we can do that uh, by uh, force control or in, in, in the next step, for example, when the center plate is moving in between these two plates and you can measure the change in capacitance and, uh, the, and then you can convert the change in capacitance into displacement. So, so with this three plate capacitance structure, not only you can apply force, but you can also measure the displacements. That is uh, what, what has been done with this instrumentation, okay? So now, because you can measure the displacement, you can also control uh, the experiment uh, as a displacement control, okay? For that, you need to have a kind of a PID feedback loop. And in that loop, you try to control uh, the displacement at any point, and that will lead to a displacement controlled experiment. So this is how you do a force control experiment or a displacement control experiment, okay? Now, uh, with this uh, transducer, uh, the good thing is like, you can go and generate very small forces in a very controllable manner. That is very important. 
So uh, that is where it makes a big difference. You, the whatever the force that you generate, the, the, the displacement you measure, they are controllable and it can do very precisely. To the external light, you can generate forces down to nanonewton, and then you can measure displacement uh, as small as nanometer or less than nanometers. So this is what is making it uh, possible for us to understand the mechanical response of material at very small length scale. Now, you know, if, we, if we can mount this uh, transducer on a, a scanner, for scanner, what I mean to say is basically uh, some kind of a mechanical device that can take this transducer and scan in X, Y, and Z direction. And let's say now your tip, which is attached to this center plate is in contact with the sample surface. And then you are scanning in X and Y direction. And as it scans on the surface, because surface has some roughness, and the tip will move up and down, kind of tracing the rough surface uh, that you wanted to uh, image. And then if you record that, uh, uh, the profile of that uh, surface uh, line by line, you can create an image. So in that way that you can use the same instrument to go and see the surface uh, at very small length scale, uh, uh, down to uh, a nanometer length scale. So, so that is the additional uh, cap uh, capability of the instrument that it not only can be used to apply force and measure displacement, it can also be used to go and image on the surface to get an idea. It's kind of a visually gives you an idea what the structure looks like and, and then it gives you the capability where you want to do, go and do the, uh, do the experiment. For example, in this particular case, you can see there are images and these images were obtained by the scanning probe microscopy, where you can go and image the surface. In this first case, what I'm showing over here is a uh, uh, cell, uh, cell, cell and cell wall. You can see there are small, tiny indents being done. Okay? Underneath, you can see there is an indent and there is an image. You can see that image. You can also see the cracks in that indent. Okay? So this capability of uh, uh, the, the ability to see the surface, uh, the image the surface, plus the ability to apply control force and the displacement is what is giving you the power to do all these experiments, okay? With that basic, uh, I will get into the next step. Uh, I think I understand for pharmaceutical industry, uh, I, as uh, Kevin mentioned that uh, the fracture toughness is very important. I, I thought that it, it is a kind of a nice example to uh, give what we can do with this instrument. Uh, I just mentioned that you can do the SPM imaging to get the surface image. So, uh, and then you can also do indent to measure the uh, modulus and harness of the material. With these things, you can go and measure the fracture toughness of the material. This is particularly true and very helpful for uh, brittle materials, uh, which are very difficult to do by uh, some other way. So whereas in, in do a simple indentation experiment, you measure the modulus and the hardness, you can go do in the imaging and from the image you measure the crack length. Once you have the measure of the crack length, modulus and hardness you, uh, and the load that you apply, you can get some idea of the fracture toughness of the material. This is something also important. Uh, so I thought it is very important to put this particular slide uh, to convey that message. One thing that you have to be careful is by using this formula, there are certain limitations. For example, up to what extent you can use this uh, equation. So if you follow that and then you can do a careful measurement and then you can do this pretty, uh, pretty nicely. It may not be very quantitative in a typical uh, fracture toughness that you measure, uh, uh, but it, this is at least uh, in a kind of helpful way uh, can, uh, can give you uh, semi-quantitative information about the fracture toughness of the material, okay? So then what else we can do? We ha now have a transducer which we can use to apply force and measure the displacement response. Now, can we do something like, for example, can we superimpose a small sinusoidal force and measure the dynamic response of the material? That we can do because we can superimpose a small sinusoidal force uh, on the electrostatic, quasi-static force that you apply. And then you can measure the displacement response using a technique called lock-in detection. It is, is an instrumentation technique. Uh, what it does is basically you oscillate or modulate the force at a known frequency and you look at the response at the same frequency uh, and then get that information. So, so it only looks at that particular frequency and it rejects all the other frequency. So that is what, how it is works. 
So if you know what is the force that you are applying, you know what the force amplitude that you are applying, because these are all measurable quantities, and then measure the displacement response. And, and from that measure the displacement response and, 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 and applied force, uh, you can calculate the dynamic response of the material, particularly the viscoelastic response of the material. This particular information is very useful if you are studying uh, polymer materials, viscoelastic materials. So we can also do that with this type of instrumentation, okay? So then if you have, if you have a, a phase relationship between the force that you apply and the displacement you measure, that information also very useful, uh, particularly to understand the loss uh, property, which is uh, the loss component of the, uh, uh, when you do apply stress on a viscoelastic material, there are two components, there's a storage component and the loss component. You can also measure the loss component uh, uh, you, by measuring the phase response of the, um, uh, of the measurement, okay? So uh, not only you can do quasi-static uh, harness and uh, modulus, but you can also go use this technique to measure the uh, dynamic uh, uh, properties of the material, particularly viscoelastic properties of the material, okay? And, uh, and, and, and then uh, another thing that you can do is, for example, if you can, I can show it later uh, that you can measure the stiffness of this material uh, when you do the indent. Uh, and, and the stiffness that you, that you measure is basically directly uh, 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 proportional to the size of the contact. And I mentioned in the before, uh, before that the size of the contact that you measure is more important. Uh, and, and, and that if you know the, what is the size of the contact, the stress basically low divided by area, you can say directly contact. That you can do uh, but directly with this dynamic measurement. Uh, along with the depth information, you also get now the information about the size of the contact through the stiffness measurement. So in that way, it adds uh, the depth of information that you can get uh, and, and, and it enhances your, your understanding of the mechanical response of the material, okay? So now uh, let me, uh, Okay, sorry, something happened. So now with this uh, basic uh, capability, uh, there are many things that you can do and uh, there are a lot of testing techniques. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that you can measure harness and modulus and viscoelastic properties of the material. And now you can also use the same technique to measure the creep and stress relaxation uh, with just using this non-inundation technique. Now, if you have a transducer, uh, both in the normal and the lateral direction, you can use that kind of a configuration for uh, understanding the tribological characteristic of the material. For example, when you do the scratch, uh, you can measure the coefficient of friction and also the lateral force. And, and, and uh, from that, you can measure the shear response or, or the response due to the normal, uh, normal stress. Uh, if, if the material delaminates uh, mainly because of the scratch, uh, uh, and you can measure the addition strength. So all those things are possible by having additional transducer, which allows the force in, in, in the lateral direction. So you can do the tribological characteristic as well. I also mentioned about the in-situ SPM imaging. So which is very useful to go and see what is on the surface and, and pinpointly select a region where you want to do in then. So that way you can do the direct structure property correlation. So these are all the basic things that you can with the basic instrument, okay? Now, if you take this basic capability and then you add certain things, for example, let's like say we wanted to study at different temperature, it's kind of a, a complementary technique. So then it becomes kind of a hybrid testing technique, whereas you do this normal non-mechanical test, plus you add heat or you can cool or you can change the environment around your sample to understand, we call it in apparent always because we wanted to understand the functionality of this material at that particular environment, you can create the environment and then you can study the mechanical response, okay? Uh, or you can use this, you can put this transducer inside a, a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope, and then you can directly see as you apply stress, what is happening to this material that will give you kind of a more direct correlation about what you see as the response in the low displacement curve to what you can see inside the TEM or SEM. I will be giving some videos as an example that you will probably have a better understanding about what I am talking right now. Or you can combine this 
uh, and then the, the, this unique transducer capability with the Raman uh, micro, microscope. So we can get the uh, chem chemistry in, uh, information. Uh, for example, how the structure is changing if the material invented is going through a, a stress-induced phase transformation, you can pick that information from Raman spectroscopy. So in that way you can combine, then you can kind of bring mechanics, you can combine with chemistry, and then you can have a much better understanding of what is going on. That is also possible. Or you can put this transducer with a biological microscope. I'm going to go give a few examples on that. And, and, and then you can also do in situ and see, understand, for example, if you do it on a cell, how the cell is deforming, or let's say, for example, you have a micro capsule uh, in, in, for pharmaceutical industry, and, and it, the capsule has some drag and you're compressing that, you want to know what force and stress where that you can pop this capsule. All those things can be done with this biological microscope attachment with, uh, with, this, uh, with this transducer or you can do with an X-ray. So there is multitude of uh, complementary techniques that you can combine with this nanomechanical testing techniques. We call it this hybrid techniques. So like you said that uh, it is not just for measuring harness and modulus. There are many things that you can do. It always it is only limited by your imagination. So, so there are so many possibilities. The important part is basically that you have some uh, the transducer which has the capability to apply some force and measure capability to measure displacement so that you have now kind of a control on the stress that you apply and the, the strain that you can measure. So that is what is important. And then the rest of the thing is how you combine that with the kind of a, uh, uh, other techniques and then uh, enhance the, your understanding about the deformation mechanics of the material, okay? So let me quickly go through uh, how we do it. Somebody asked like, how can we do at a different temperature? Yes. Uh, this technique has been developed in a way that now we can do uh, as high as 1000 degrees C at nanometer length scale. And if you ask me like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would say, no, no, it's not possible. Because when you heat something, the thermal expansion is, is in micron scale. And now you're trying to go understand something at nanometer length scale, how you can do that. But, but we were able to engineer this uh, over a period of time where we develop a pretty nice uh, uh, heating stage. It's a unique uh, kind of a design where you have a top heating element. You can underneath here, you can see this uh, heating stage. It has two heaters that you can heat the sample from the top, you can heat the sample from the bottom. And it's kind of sandwiched between these two heater. And in between these two heater, you kind of create a gap, basically small chamber uh, through this gasket. And in that chamber, you can pass uh, uh, shield gas to have whatever the gas is, atmosphere that you wanted to have, or you can have a humid air to have a humid, humid presence, or you can pass a cold air, uh, cold uh, uh, nitrogen to change the temperature to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, cryogenic temperature. So you can have kind of an environment where you want to do the test, and then you can do the test. You can see a small hole on the top uh, heater through which that in the tip pass through, and, and that's all the experiment. So in, 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 the, in this particular design, the important part is we engineered in a way that we use thermal expansion to our advantage, and we kind of selected materials and did the design in a way the thermal expansion cancels each other. So the net thermal expansion along the z-axis is only six nanometers per degree C in, 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 in change in temperature. And, and that allowed us to go and do experiment at nanometer length scale. Even if the temperature fluctuations are in degree C, the only thermal expansion that you see with respect to this kind of a heater instrumentation is only one nanometer, uh, six nanometers per degree C. But now if you can go and control the temperature within like 0 0.01 degree C, you can do pretty much a nanometer length scale experiment even at very high temperature, okay? At low temperature, you can go down to minus 120 degrees C. I think I'm going to go show a couple of examples. Uh, this particular experiment is done on silicon, uh, and nothing to do with the organic crystal, but it come kind of giving you kind of what you can do with this kind of instrumentation, where you have a grid of indents, area of indents, and again, like this indents can be done very fast. For example, in uh, five indents in per second, for example, this whole indentation experiment can be done within like 30, 40 seconds. Uh, before you know. And, and then you can get a property as a function of temperature. This is uh, it's an interesting results. That's why I put uh, harness of silicon as a function of temperature. 
and 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 then you can see so you you learn something new from from this that's why i put this slide and kind of it kind of gave us a, what kind of a competing mechanisms uh, responsible for the change in harness as a function of temperature now I mentioned that in, in cryogenic setup, you can go down to minus 120 degrees C. Uh, uh, the one typical example that I can readily give is uh, on steel. Uh, we haven't done much on organic crystals, uh, but this is kind of uh, kind of example that I'm trying to give. Now you can measure harness as a function of temperature from room temperature to very, very cold temperature. In this particular plot, you can see uh, the ductile to brittle transition, for example, the harness is uh, increasing slowly and it goes through the transition. And this transition becomes from a ductile type of response to a brittle type of response. Uh, we call ductile to brittle transition that you can observe from this change in harness as a function of temperature to the lowest temperature. You can also see that kind of in, in the low displacement curve response. For example, uh, at room temperature, these low displacement curves are very smooth. As you reduce the temperature, you can start to see this uh, serration on the low displacement curve, mainly because there is a transition in deformation from ductile uh, uh, deformation to a brittle tan deformation. So you can also kind of observe this ductile to brittle transition. So with this ability, we were able to change the temperature uh, to very low temperature and you can measure the mechanical response of the material. That's all I want to convey here. Okay, now somebody asked about, okay, can we do experiments on, on soft materials, as, uh, gels and things like that? Yes, uh, you can mount this transducer in a biological microscope, and, and then this is an inverted biological microscope. If the material is transparent, as you do uh, apply stress, you can see what is happening to the sample. And that gives you an understanding that I will call it in situ because you can also see as you apply stress what is going on into the sample. For example, if you have a tissue, you can indent and then see how the tissue responds. You can get the low displacement response of the material. The one thing about this, I think can make tighter address this, these materials are very soft. So which means that you need to have very high force sensitivity. At the same time, when you apply very small forces, the displacement ranges will be very high. So we need to have very large displacement measurement capability. So in this particular transducer, it has about 150 micron displacement range, and, and then it can apply very small forces. And so it's a very high force sensitivity. With that combination, mounting onto a biological microscope, you can understand the biological response of the material, soft materials. I'm going to go give one example. Here is for contact lens. Like for example, when you bring a tip, make contact on a contact lens, and then load and unload. This is the kind of uh, response that you get from the low displacement curve. What it shows is basically as the tip approaches makes contact with the sample, you will have a jump to contact. This is for people who have used the AFM, they can clearly understand that. This is mainly because this jump to contact happens mainly because of the surface forces that pulls the tip into the sample. And then you do the, and then you see the normal load displacement curve. When you pull off because of addition between the sample uh, and, and, and the tip, uh, and then you can see that this is a negative force and negative force means addition and you can measure the addition force. So all those things can be done uh, by having a, a very sensitive transducer which can uh, be used to measure the force and the displacement. Uh, with, from this, you can do a lot of other, for example, uh, uh, in combination with the uh, uh, in, with the optical microscope, I mentioned that you can see directly, in this case, this is a PDMS, uh, if, for example, uh, let me, okay, the, the, the tip is approaching, you can see the contact formation, uh, and this is done in situ. At the same time, you are, you are getting the low displacement curve, but from this video, you can also extract the size of the contact as you apply the force. That size of the contact is what is being plotted over here. With that information, in addition to models that you can measure, you can also measure the pull-off forces. From that, you can measure what is the surface energy and things like that. So it kind of adds up. So now, for example, if you have a gel, uh, if you wanted to understand the property of the gel, you can measure directly with this technique. Or if you have a gel, uh, maybe a capsule or something, you can apply the stress and see how the, cap the capsule is kind of a, 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 a deforming or exploding and releasing the material inside, and you can directly correlate that, okay? So now, uh, uh, now uh, I, I will jump into the uh, next type of instrumentation where I mentioned that you can put this transducer inside a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope. 
In this particular case, it is a scanning electron microscope. Underneath the uh, electron gun, you can see the transducer, you can see the tip, and you have stages. These are all miniaturized stages. You can put a sample over there, and then you can move the sample in X, Y, and Z direction. And because you can see what is happening inside the SEM as you apply the stress, it is very, very powerful. Uh, and with this instrumentation, you can do the experiment. I'm going to go show one particular uh, example over here. This is for an, a fiber epoxy composite. These are all the fibers in a matrix. And then the, here, what you can see is the in under tip. I'm going to go show this video that you can pretty much observe what is happening as you apply. And uh, this whole specimen is moving down. You know, the, the load is increasing. At some point, this fiber is going to go push out from the matrix. And that is what we wanted to measure at what force or what stress this fiber is getting pushed from the matrix. Uh, from that information, we can get a lot of uh, what is the kind of interfacial bond between this fiber and the matrix. It's, if it, I'm kind of giving an example. You can extrapolate to your area where you wanted to use, where here you have a direct confirmation of what you measure as for the low displacement response with respect to the video that you see. So there is no ambiguity. When you see a jump or a fracture, there is no ambiguity at all as why and what is happening. And then you can directly get that from the video and then you can map it to the stress strain or the low displacement response you get from this experiment. So that is the power of that, okay? So this is another example. This is a semiconductor packaging basically uh, and uh, let me see, uh, let me, I think I can run this video as well. You can see that the tip, this is a three, we call three point bend test. You have a structure, stacked structure, you're applying a stress onto the sample. At some point it's going to break, okay? Now it have kind of a cone type of crack and you have a low displacement curve. From this low displacement curve, you can calculate the stress. This jump in is basically because of the fracture, okay? Now let's go look at this particular curve, uh, particular video where you see that it's kind of a same structure, but with a different kind of a, a, a landscape. And, and now you see that this fracture is totally different. The, the fracture that happened before was conical type. Here it's kind of a, 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 a straight vertical type, but you have the same low displacement response, but the way that it fracture is different, that information you only get from the video. If you just look at only the low displacement of uh, response, you won't have that information. So that's why, when you do this inside something like a TEM or, or an optical microscope or an SEM, you have a direct understanding of what is going on. Uh, I'm sorry, just let me. Okay. Uh, so you can directly correlate to uh, what you see in the video to the low displacement response that you measure. Okay. This, is, this particular example is very useful. I understand uh, from manufacturing point of view for pharmaceutical industry, uh, the one thing that will be interesting to you is, okay, let's say you have a particle uh, or, or powder, you have a size that you take with, and then you wanted to change it to, a, reduce it to a size before you tabulating. Uh, you, you do that inside a ball mill or something. This is typically how in powder metallurgy also we do. We take a sample, we take a material, we put it into the ball mill, we, we, we do the ball milling. After some time, the size of this particle is going to be reduced. But the point is how much time that you have to spend do this ball milling, what kind of a processing parameter that you need to use, and can we get some information from uh, this type of uh, studies? For example, particle compression, okay? I'm, I'm come, going to come to that. For example, in this case, this is a silica particle uh, inside the SEM with the stages that we have that has a capability for rotation as well as tilt. We can orient the tip at whatever way we want and kind of identify a particle and you can compress and you can get some information. I'm going to show another video over here, okay? Here is the same particle, I'm compressing it. Uh, after some time, I reach a maximum load and then I can oscillate the force. You can, this is what we call dynamic uh, experiment. And then you can see how, how the material is deforming uh, as a function of time with this oscillatory force, okay? And this is kind of a fatigue test. Uh, and, and this is done on a particle, which is about a micron in size, okay? You can see this uh, uh, scale over here, scale bar, 500 nanometer, by the, the actual size is about one micron. So if you have a micron size particle and, and you can directly see how, what is the deformation it is going on, it is, you can see very high strain it is going through and you can apply dynamic force. 
and you can understand the response. For example, let me look at this low displacement curve. In this particular case, you indent the sample, you compress this sample, and then at point some, somewhere here at some load, which is about 72 millinewton, you see a jump in this low displacement curve. This happens mainly because of what's happening inside the material. It could be basically a slip or it could be a fracture. Okay, let's say you have a brittle particle, you are applying a stress, and this particle is going to fracture or it's going to be plastically deforming. Okay, now what you have is, is this low displacement curve, and you know what the load it takes to fracture or a deformation, and from that load you can calculate what the stress is, and you also know what is the displacement it fracture or, 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 or undergo some kind of plastic deformation. So from that information, you can also calculate the strain. So from the stress and the strain, for example, let's say you have a particle of say uh, 100 microns and, and it, it, that you wanted to, in a ball mill, you wanted to reduce the size to uh, 50 microns, okay? What kind of uh, uh, force that you are, the energy that you need to reduce to uh, that 50% strain, okay? That you can directly get from this low displacement curve, okay? You know what the stress you have to apply, you know what the strain that it takes to reduce to that size. But if you take the area under the curve, you also know what is the work done. Basically, what, how, much, how much amount of work needs to be done to get to that size. That will correlate to the parameter that you probably use in ball milling. That is very useful for, uh, for processing in pharmaceutical industry, okay? So now I mentioned that particle compression, and this is kind of a kind of tangent idea I'm giving so let's say you have a nano size particle and you have a drug inside. This is a basically a hollow sphere. This is barium titanate. I'm kind of giving you a kind of an idea or um, uh, uh, some uh, that, that it may inspire you to go into working in this area. This particle is about 100 nanometer, okay, 100 to 200 nanometer. It's a hollow sphere. This is barium titanate. And you can see the shell structure again. And inside there is nothing. For example, in this case, you can put some drug into it. Now, if you want to pop this shell structure, what kind of force that you require? For example, this is an experiment done inside a TEM. You can go and do this experiment inside a TEM and at point B, it fractured. We know what the size and shape of this particle and we know what the force we applied. From that, we can calculate what kind of stress it took to pop this uh, capsule. So I'm kind of giving you an idea that we can even use this if you have nano size capsule delivery system. If you wanted to know what kind of forces it requires to uh, pop this capsule to deliver the drug, you can do that this type of, with this type of instrumentation, okay? Now, uh, I, finally, I wanted to jump into, do I have some time? Uh, uh, five, how much time? Yeah, five minutes, minutes. okay. Yeah. Okay, that this is very important. I think this is something that we developed mainly uh, for pharmaceutical industry. Uh, for example, I mentioned all these things that you can have a hybrid technique where you can uh, combine something with something. The one thing that was missing for a very long time in my research was basically, how do we correlate to the actual chemistry of what we see on the surface, okay? Uh, this particular case, uh, we wanted to solve a problem of uh, stress-induced phase transformation in silicon, and that's why we developed in which case what we did was basically you take uh, uh, our instrument and you combine with the Raman. And in this particular, it is a XC2. Basically you have the Raman microscope attachment onto the, uh, onto the same system where you can go back and forth between the Raman as well as inundation. Okay, I'm going to go on this particular example over here. This is aspirin polymorph. This particular uh, uh, exercise was done with uh, one of my colleague, Praveena and, and uh, our collaborators and, and this, a problem was worked with uh, worked by uh, Ramamurthy and Professor Desi Raju a long time ago. But what we were trying to understand was if we have Raman, what additional information that Raman can bring with respect to this kind of uh, uh, testing, and that's what we did. Uh, and, and this is also very important. Basically, uh, as uh, a previous speaker mentioned, that uh, uh, this uh, organic crystal they have polymorphs, and, and that's kind of a headache for processing as well. Okay. Aspirin has, for example, in this case, you have two farms, farm one and farm two. And when you apply stress, uh, they may have change in, 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 in the structure, uh, depending upon what kind of state of stress they are subject to. For example, when you do in a pure hydrostatic pressure, it changes from farm one to farm, uh, farm three when, when you have pressures about two GPA. 
but but uh, when, when in, in inundation uh, the point is basically you can create this kind of a stress for example in inundation when you do indent beneath the inunder you have a zone which ha which goes through a hydrostatic uh, state of stress which is two third hydrostatic or uh, one third shear basically so you have both shear as well as hydrostatic component okay so with that kind of state of stress, the material may change from one form to another form. In this particular case, it is aspirin, it changes from form two to form one, okay? And that you can observe uh, in the low displacement curve as pop-ins and things like that, as previously the speakers mentioned. But now we combine that with, uh, with, uh, with Raman, uh, we should be able to get that information from the Raman spectra. That's what we did. For example, this is the typical Raman spectra that you get. Here, the most important peak is 3081 and 3096. The relative intensity of these peaks is going to give you what type of form it is, whether it is a form one or form two. And from the low displacement curve and, and from the, from the uh, Raman uh, results, we will be able to say uh, what type of form it is. In this particular case, for example, we did experiments from uh, loads from zero to five millinewton. As you increase the load and you go and map the surface with Raman, particularly at the indent site, and you measure uh, the ratio of the intensity of 3081, 3096, we were able to see that it is transforming from form two to form one. That you can see in this next image, where you go and get the intensity map uh, of, uh, of the indent site. You can, this is for 3081, and this is for 3096. If you take the ratio, you can see that the ratio is pretty high at the indent site where we can pre uh, we clearly confirm that that indent site uh, the in center of the indent, it has transformed from form two to form one, okay? So now uh, you, you can also correlate that with, uh, with the, uh, the stress strain that you can uh, measure or from the stiffness that you can measure from the dynamic experiment. You can see that there is a dip or there is a jump in the stiffness that may be correlated to the change in mechanical, uh, for example, from form one to form, form two to form, one, one the, you can see that the models of the material is different uh, and the deal stress of the material is different. For example, form one is pretty rigid because of its mechanical structure. It's a very rigid interlocked structure. Form two uh, about 555 MPa, which is much softer to, uh, compared to form one. So uh, that re reflects on the, on the mechanical response. Okay, so now, uh, now, I, 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 this is a very important thing. Like uh, somebody mentioned about polyform morph. I think most of the time you need to have X-ray or some other technique to see these domains of polymorphs in the material, but you can also use harness testing. In this case, we are doing uh, harness as a function of a, a position. For example, you do an array of indents, uh, I mean, hundreds of them on the surface. In this particular case, you have a gap about two micron between the indents, right? And then the maximum force here is about 100 micron, uh, 100 micron per, uh, uh, per, per indent. And you can do high throughput, for example, you can do five indents per second. And then you can uh, kind of generate a map of the harness map on the surface. This is for 100 form one type surface. You can see the harness is pretty much uniform and it's not, uh, there's only it's all form one. And on, on, uh, on another phase, on form two phase, when you do the indent, you can see the, the, the harness of that particular phase. And, and sometime, like on form two, when you do indent, you do have the mixed phase, basically for both form one and form two, which are basically micro domains. And from the harness map, you can identify these micro domains. Okay, and that is the power of this. And you can do all of that in 30, 40 seconds. You don't need to spend a half a day doing these experiments now anymore. You can do like a high speed indents, like five indents per second, and you can over uh, map over a larger surface area. In this case, this is about 20 micron by 20 micron. And then you can identify from the harness measurement where, where is the form one or where is the form two. And this ability it, by harness mapping is something which is very useful from pharmaceutical industry if you wanted to understand the polymorphs, okay? And, and the, the experiments that I've shown before was basically done, like for example, you do indent and then you go back to the Raman microscope and you do that way. But here, the way we have uh, thought may be useful is that when you do the experiment, then and there, as you doing, as you are applying the stress, can we do the Raman map? Can we get the Raman spectra? That is what has been done with this particular mechanical setup, where you put the whole uh, instrument under a Raman microscope, 
uh, as you apply the stress, you through the Raman microscope, you get the Raman spectra in, in, in real, okay? So uh, this is for pyroxicam, uh, Professor Kevin talked about this. Uh, you can, for example, in this particular case, you can do uh, a, a, this is zero, one bar one phase in then, and you can measure the response from the uh, perpendicular surface, and you can get the Raman spectra, and, uh, and then, um, you can see the mechanical anisotropy depending upon the surface. This is a very important result. Uh, for example, when we did on, uh, on zero one bar one phase and this particular peaks, basically one, three, three, four, which is uh, uh, for, for a particular stretching mode, uh, as you apply uh, the load at maximum load, it, 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 the peak shifted, blue shifted to one, three, two, six, and then you unload it recovered a little bit, but it didn't uh, recover all, all to what, what it was before. So we were able to observe that in real time with, with the Raman spectra when you do in situ. And this is for 0, 1, 1 phase. Uh, and it, in that case, basically the red shifted from 990 to 995 at, at maximum load when you apply. So I'm kind of giving you kind of an understanding that by combining that with Raman microscope, not only you can understand the mechanical response, but you can also go understand the, the structural response or, or, or the chem chemistry uh, along with the mechanics. So I think uh, uh, the organizers are ready to boot me out. So I'll stop here <laughs> and, 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 and take, any, take any question. Okay, good. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Asif. Thanks for the wonderful uh, you know, presentation and uh, demonstrating like you know showing how actually this technique can be taken to a next level so I hope uh, some of us will be able to use uh, these equipment in the near future uh, we take maybe a couple of one or two two questions maybe and then we will uh, close Malaya. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes please say it is really really very interesting talk uh, my, uh, there may be more uh, questions around. I, I have a very basic question. Sure. Uh, uh, you have uh, shown us some silicon temperature, uh, uh, variable temperature study. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, are there any pharmaceutical or organic uh, crystals uh, study uh, in the temperature mode? Is there any difficulty with that? Uh, so I... There, uh, mm, I, 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 I don't know. I'm not aware. Mala may be more, more yes. into it, basically. Uh, but what I can say is we have the capability to hit the sample, but we don't have the capability to make the sample not to jump. <laughs> That's something we cannot avoid. But uh, we have, uh, to some extent, to control the load and force within the force range or the displacement range <laughs> we can control. But I can assure you that we, we can have a very stable temperature. We can have a high thermal stability on our heating stage. Uh, we can take the sample and heat it up and see what's happening. But I, I think Mala probably have done this experiment. Uh, yes, I'm yes. not sure. I'm, okay, so that, that so, answer uh, they, is yes then. <laughs> yeah, with Ram, we have a paper. So this was done some time ago. And uh, so not many people have done. Uh, we have the instruments, so we are doing some of the experiments. So it is really useful for studying the polymorphs in situ yeah. transfer, like, you know, transformations and things like that. You can also go to a little bit of low temperature. Yeah. So it, it's very good. I mean, it's stable, actually. It's not a problem. Yeah. In, okay. in one of your, yeah, in one of your studies, you have shown your indenter sizes uh, bigger than the sample silicon. So how reliable in those cases uh, with the uh, data that you I... get? I don't understand the uh, in the size. It can't be basically now. Normally, with the short tips that we are talking about, uh, typical tip radius of curvature is about. Uh, uh, it, it starts with uh, about 100 nan 100 nanometers. 30 nanometers. 30 nanometers. Yeah, but if we have sharp tips with the 30 nanometer as well. So the tip radius is about 30 nanometer with sharp tips. But the tips can be changed to whatever the shape that you want. You can sometimes have a pyramidal tip. Sometimes you can have a spherical tip. Sometimes you can have a cylindrical tips. Uh, and, and depending upon application. And so I, I mentioned I mentioned that, uh, that you, you don't have to just do nanometer. You can do particle compression. In that case, your tip is much bigger than your particle. It has to be, otherwise you can't compress. Uh, that is what probably you probably saw. Uh, you yeah. have a bigger tip and then you have a particle and you wanted to mm -hmm. compress the particle. That particular test is basically a compression of this particle rather than inundation. 
Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as if there is a big, uh, you know, community, mechanochemistry. So they study the reactions, and all they might be very much uh, interested actually to look at this. Yeah. So there is one yep. question from Manish here. Uh, he said yep. recently, Manish, you can unmute yourself. You can directly talk to him. Yes, yeah, as Manish. Yes, Manish. <laughs> Hey, uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So, I can hear the, you, Manish. so recently, like the few uh, publication, what they're telling that uh, when we do the in situ SPM, you know, after the indentation, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. they can damage the surface, you know, sometimes. So how mm -hmm. we can uh, how we can you know, solve this issue? We should not damage the because uh, sometimes if we have a pile up or something like that, so it should not mm -hmm. affect the pile. You, while you, image. You, now you're talking about uh, uh, electron beam damage or what damage you're talking about? No, it's like surface can, yeah, I mean, you can see the, there's a roughness on the surface we can see, like, uh, I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know so how- to, Using SEM Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so SEM, 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 we are not in, it's non-contact, right? SEM, no, you can SPM. directly see what's happening. SPM, yeah. SPM. okay, yeah. SPM, you, the, 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 we maintain very small forces, okay, uh, and, and depending upon the sample, we, if it's soft sample, definitely it's difficult to image, but uh, uh, harder samples, it's okay. I think we can maintain about like 30 nanonewton force, contact force, we can still image without deforming or, 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 or uh, changing the uh, morphology of the surface, okay. And if you wanted to image at, uh, at nanonewton or less than nanonewton, it is possible. We have transducer, which we call MEMS transducer, uh, which can go down to piconewton forces and you can image like an AFM. Okay? They, they don't, they, they, we were able to image very soft sample with that too. Okay. 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 So, Thank you. Okay. Yeah. There is a question, an interesting question from Aman, Aman Prit Kaur. So Aman Prit, do you want to ask directly? Uh, uh, yes, sir, I yeah. can ask. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, sir, I wanted to know for understanding the milling behavior of organic crystals, which mm -hmm. parameter is a better indicator? Uh, should we measure particle compression or uh, uh, fracture toughness? Well, I think probably both. For example, like uh, if your aim is uh, to say, uh, if you want to reduce uh, a particle from size A to size B, okay, and if, if that size B is 50% strain uh, and, and that you can get, for example, how much energy that you need to put into that sample to make size A to size B to say 50% strain, that you can get from the low displacement area under the curve will give you that, okay? Right. So if, right. let's say when you are compressing if the particle fractures, that also gives you kind of what is the uh, kind of fracture energy, uh, amount of energy that you have to put to get that fracture. Okay, you can do that with the particle okay. compression. And sir, yeah. uh, is crystal hardness uh, and the fracture toughness the same or are they different? No, no. no. The fracture toughness is uh, uh, the materials of uh, uh, brittle behavior, basically. Hardness is basically a measure of the plasticity of the material. They're both okay. different. Okay. okay. So in this case, uh, we should measure fracture toughness. Uh, fracture, you can use fracture toughness as a measure of the brittleness of the material. Exactly, okay. exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so for, for mechanochemistry, you know, I think uh, fracture is more important, but uh, definitely yeah. these are in, these are related and both are important. And uh, yeah, both there are important. not many studies to, you know, say which one is more important, but fracture is yeah. uh, definitely yeah. Yeah. important. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we there were a couple already... of other questions uh, somebody asked before, right? Or do you have those questions? I, I kind of uh, forgot. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, there was a... So there was one. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So there was a question on the pileup. Uh, okay. Please okay. tell reasons behind pileup. <laughs> okay. Uh, so pileup is basically, yeah, I can give you a, 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 an answer. See, you have a, a geometry. The indicator has a specific geometry and you are pushing that geometry into the sample which means that you are displacing that volume of material. It has to go somewhere. If the material can accommodate, there won't be any pileup. If the material can't accommodate, it has to, it, the easiest way is to go to the surface. That's why you have the pileup. That is a very, very simple answer for you. you Here I have one question. Uh, one question about this pileup. Is, uh, is that any soft material can also show the pileup or only hard material can show the pileup? Pile up, like uh, Pijush said, it depends upon uh, the type of material. So if the material cannot, if, for example, soft material can accommodate by, 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 uh, by densification. 
in that case you won't see pile up but if you can't accommodate that volume displaced by the indenter it has to go somewhere okay most of the materials are incompressible so what they for example in metal cases of metal it can't go somewhere and it depends upon the strain that you put okay if the strain is too high it has to go to the surface that's why it comes to the surface and forms the pile up it, it it entirely depends upon the material and it also depends upon the geometry of the probe that you use if you use a very sharp probe very acute angle uh, you putting too much strain the material can't accommodate so it will it will come up to the surface yep okay yeah so asif i have a related question basically so if the material is more plastic then it is uh, less likely to give uh, pile up is there direct not, not correlation necessarily. to some extent not necessarily like for example you take copper okay you take the copper is the same material you anneal the copper and you work hard on the copper which means there are two different state it is the same material but when you do the indent on anneal copper you will have a sink in whereas when you do on a work hard on copper you have a pile up it basically depends upon the dislocation density okay. right so is so it somewhat related to the uh, local hardness kind of a lot like it, 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 it is related to the uh, defect density uh, it can it could be a dislocation or it could be a porosity it's basically related to the defect density okay some kind of a hardening it's related to the work yeah, hardening yeah. kind of yeah yeah work hardening well, if you have work hardening it will pile up okay, okay. but if, if you have less dislocation it will sink in, in with respect to metals okay. but i think yeah. we can kind of use that analogy for anything if you have porous more porous you will come i mean you have densification you won't see minus of pile up right so yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. thanks asif so yeah. are there any questions uh, pratyank uh, no i think uh, we are good it looks like right okay yeah. great so uh, with this uh, thank you very much uh, uh, asif for the wonderful uh, explanation of the fundamentals and then uses of uh, nano indentation technique and different dimensions basically most of these are not explored to full potential i know that these are all new developments so hopefully we'll be able to uh, you know get some funds to buy some yeah. of these <laughs> at some point <laughs> so yeah thank you very yeah. much and uh, With this i invite uh, pratyank to conclude and uh, yeah give both of thanks yep i would uh, on, on behalf of organizing committee actually first so, i would like to thank, thank. Uh, before that if if uh, asif has any message short message i would like to ask uh, you know yeah actually yeah, it's good yeah. for then pharma industry i know I, <laughs> I, i know so uh, this has been kind of a my dream for a long time i i know we've been uh, spending time see we we uh, we can develop things based on the feedback okay i'm i'm, I'm kind of yeah. spoke to metal industry ceramics and polymers and bio uh, and we we saw the problems so we kind of anticipated what needs to be done even before they realized the problem we were able to come up with some solution and we kind of a problem solver we try to solve the problem so that's that's uh, that we do through instrumentation so that's how we developed all this instrumentation that's one thing so more feedback i get from uh, from this uh, particular domain uh, we were able to help this uh, we will, particular area yeah. we will be able to do that the second thing is we have a pretty nice lab in 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 india in trantrum uh, with with all these facilities uh, pujush extended his uh, his lab for, for helping people we are we are open to that too so we we yeah. are not just uh, we, we we like to collaborate uh, we we develop that culture of collaboration we believe in it and that is the way we can develop this whole field so people are welcome to collaborate with us uh, so that's some something that i wanted to just convey okay yep i i also put that message in our chat for everyone yeah. like if yeah. feel free to reach us for any yeah reach us yep okay that's yep. that's my so, message okay yeah, yeah. so you. just a <laughs> quick word of i know it's getting late but uh, we have to do this so Basically, on behalf of all, the whole organizing committee, I would like to thank all our speakers, Professor Pijush Ghosh, uh, Professor Calvin Sun for spending time over the weekend, and absolutely uh, Dr. Asif for his sharing his uh, 30 years of his knowledge and experience on the instrumentation side. But obviously, both of guys, like from Dr. Calvin and uh, Dr. Asif, are in, you know in the Minneapolis, so it's like early morning for them. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, yeah. But I know a lot of our uh, participants as well are good to see overwhelming response from the participant side. 
we have got uh, participation from all across the globe from australia to i could say the covering the whole globe uh, to, up to the us so yeah so good to have everybody and with their contribution we could do this and make it a successful event and nevertheless i also would like to thank uh, aisha kolkata and professor reddy for his guidance and you know bringing this event up and also uh, brooker and industron for sharing uh, you know you know the 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 work and the uh, and present this uh, event for the for the audience uh, and yeah this is our first attempt in india to bridge the you know to bring material scientists and uh, you know pharmaceutical background guy or crystal engineering uh, background people together and you know to see the potential of uh, this technology towards pharma applications so i would like to thank everyone here so with that i we conclude our session today uh, so be safe during this pandemic stay safe and uh, yeah have a good night a good morning some places see you thank guys you again all. bye thank you all thank <laughs> you bye bye thank you thank Thanks you thank you everyone yeah. thank you everyone thank you yep happy thank new you year. waslo <laughs> yeah happy new year thank you everyone manish venu anand everyone thank you very much and bye Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks, Malla and all the organizers. It is very good. Excellent. Bye bye bye. It was nice bye -bye. talk. Nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Asif. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Reddy. Bye bye. Thank you, Malla. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Take bye. care. I'm going to close it now. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye -bye.